This is Albury Park Mansion in Surrey. Nigel and Jennifer Worley bought Albury six years ago, but gradually the cost of running the house overwhelmed them and they amassed debts of more than four million pounds. The bank wanted its money back and the Wallies were desperate. A year ago they turned to Ruth Watson for help to save their home from repossession. What the hell were you doing buying it? Champagne and lovely women that way. You're so laid back. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know why you think it's all going to be all right. Twelve months on, have the Wallies found a way to make Albury pay for itself? Specifically, since I last saw you, how many have you sold? Albury Park Mansion is a Grade II listed country house in the Surrey Hills. When Nigel Wally and his second wife Jennifer bought Albury four years ago, it seemed like a dream come true. As a retirement home containing 33 apartments owned by elderly residents, Albury allowed Nigel to carry on his life's work as a carer and keep an apartment in grand surroundings. But he soon discovered the business plan was flawed as many of the retirees moved on or died and he was unable to resell the empty flats. It quickly became obvious and there was no way that we could make enough money to really keep the house going. As apartments become free, the Wallies are obliged to buy them back. So far, they've been forced to borrow four million pounds for 16 of them. And when Nigel lost his son, he took his eye off the ball financially. Losing Jonathan, his only child, um, is something that can never be overcome. Now, at £700,000 a year, running costs at Albury are spiralling out of control. The gas bill alone each year is 60000 now. So you get about 40000 50000 a month without even blinking. In desperation, the Wallies are getting out of the retirement business to sell their apartments to younger buyers. But the flats are tiny and ill-equipped, and so far, they haven't sold any. We have a time scale with the bank now, really, of a review in about six months' time, that unless we've started to sell a few within that period, then it is going to be uh, a real problem. Ruth is on her way to Surrey to rescue Albury. We are praying that she'll be able to do that for Albury, because really, I think without her, we may not survive now. Welcome to Albury. Hello, you're Jennifer, yes? Hi, Hello, Nigel. Nigel. Hello. Hello. Nice to Very see you. Very good to see you. Come inside. It's a bit chilly, isn't it? Ruth starts with an exploratory tour of the stately rooms. This is magical and you will be breathless. Oh, my word. A great room. It is great, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. This room and the drawing room next door are owned by the Wallies but used as common areas for the elderly residents and they have historic significance. It was used in 1762 for the coronation ball for George III. When we had our own ball here, and we were all dancing in the footsteps of a king, that was really lovely. It's very romantic. Mm -hmm. It makes me instantly nervous, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the rooms are occasionally used for weddings, which could be a big money spinner. But the Wallies fear that turning Albury into a wedding venue would disturb their elderly residents. But Jennifer does love to share the house with others, especially for a good cause. I get very nervous about charitable balls because my experience of this is that whenever the people arranging it, they've spent all the budget and they leave you with five pounds per head to do the rest of it. And yes. then you end up with Yes, the... we, we do have to watch that very carefully. We do carefully, have to watch it. But it's a great reward to do it. Mm. I mean, obviously, we're not looking to make money out of the charitable ones. Uh, and we limit I them. would. In the centre of the house, next to the great rooms, sits the slightly less than grand dining room. The 22 elderly residents pay a service charge in return for all meals and are catered for by 18 staff. Is there a buffet every evening? Yes, there That's is. Right. Now, in my experience, buffets are one of the biggest loss-making things you can do. I don't know how many people ate tonight, but yeah. it can't be more than about 10, and there was enough food there to feed, feed about 
20? Mm. 20 young rugby players, I would say. I mean, what are you going to do with that food? Well, staff, we have some. I knew you'd say that. Some. It's just madness. I look at it and I just think, first thing, OK, you're going to tell me the staff are going to get it. You're feeding them far too well, if that's yeah. the case. Mm. So do you know what your staff costs are? I do, yes, yeah. Can you tell me? Um, it's about £25,000 a month. A month? Mm. A month. So 300000 or so a year. That's a heck of a lot. What is your turnover? About 650000 So, I mean, you're knocking on for nearly 50%. Mm. That is so, so way out of kilter. You know, you might have to make some redundancies. As a solution to their failing retirement business, the Wallies have started to renovate the flats they bought back in a frantic bid to sell them to a younger market. Ruth thinks she may know why they're not shifting. Just pretend I'm a 30-something couple and I think um, I want to commute into either Guildford or London. Heard about this place, looks fabulous. I drive up the drive, I'm singularly impressed with it all. And then I come in here and I go... <laughs> You know, what have I come into? What the hell were you doing buying it in the first place with all this encumbrance? I mean, I just don't get it. I would have run a mile. Obviously, we have got a core <coughs> of these retirees who are still with us, and there's no way we can abandon them. All the public rooms, everything that has something you can sell in a commercial way should be part and parcel of that yes. commerce. Nigel and Jennifer are desperate to save their home. But is this mammoth house simply too much for them? You have dealt with the last four years with incredible incompetence. I still feel as if I'm not certain who you think is going to live here. Four years ago, Nigel and Jennifer Wally bought Albury Park Mansion near Guildford in Surrey. Albury was first mentioned in the Doomsday Book. In 1819, architect Augustus Pugin, famed for his work on the Houses of Parliament, embellished Albury with 63 individually designed Gothic revivalist chimneys. In the grounds is a beautiful 1,000-year-old church dating back to Saxon times. Inside, the light-filled drawing room was designed by Sir John Soane while his first known cantilevered staircase dominates the hall. Ruth is keen to find out what stance the bank have taken on the Woolies financial crisis. Well, yes, they put fairly stringent controls on how much we spend on a monthly basis. Uh, they want to have monthly meetings for the next few months. If we start selling apartments and the loan comes down, which hopefully we will, um, then that won't be a, be a problem. I and mean, if we don't, then you know, the whole thing will go into the melting pot. But since deciding to get out of the retirement business, the Wallies haven't sold any flats. Many of the apartments are woefully inadequate for attracting a wealthier market. Ruth wants to see the extent of the problem. Well, this is the sitting room, come kitchen, kitchenette, really which rather illustrates the point uh, of the halfway house that we're at, as much as it was originally designed when we were looking at the retirees who were going to eat all their meals downstairs, basically, and just wanted basic items. Have you got a show flat where actually everything is done to the standard that you would love it to be done, it's furnished, it's kitted out, it's something that somebody can instantly see and say, yep, that's for me? Well, no, we haven't, and now we're looking at a different market. We've got to look at the different ways and what we need to put in here, so mm. suggestions are welcome, really. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Ruth's unimpressed by Nigel's casual approach. I'm not convinced that Nigel understands about property development. There's too many apartments lying empty, too many that aren't the right size. Above all, he doesn't know who the customers are going to be. He hasn't profiled them. He hasn't made a grand plan for the building. This is not one of his strengths. Thank you, thank you. Without Bye a show flat, 
I'll take you into apartment 35 Great. first. OK. The Wallys Super. are presenting unrenovated apartments Hello. to sort after new blood. This is um, uh, obviously a low apartment. This is one okay. of the pantries or the laundry or something like this. We have yes. a bathroom there and yeah. a sort of dressing area there. Then we have a second bedroom through here. Right. This will be made into a much larger darling. kitchen area. Yes. Well, I've got the apartment out there, darling. Nigel is normally chief salesman and is unhappy with the apartment Jennifer is showing their potential buyer. An amazing ability to do everything wrong. But the Muse apartment Nigel wants Mr Nixon to see is let and set up for retirees. And then there's a very small um, kitchen here. We do prepare three meals a day if you choose to yes. have them. You can so you've have got the option of either eating in or either going across to the yes. main house. I think it's great that he likes the services. But having said that, you see, they haven't actually been to look at the dining room yet and they haven't seen all the old folks yomping with toothless gums on their custard. My husband's the man to talk to about it all. Yes. So we had a little look. I think he was very keen to talk to Mr Nixon. Yes. Does he sure. trust you with this? No, <laughs> never. I've allowed the cats and dogs and everything menial. <laughs> and I do menial very well. <laughs> you are sweet. <laughs> Right. right, thank you. Thank you. Follow us, then. Jennifer talks about her menial role, and it's obvious that she doesn't have much self-esteem at all. The problem really is that Nigel simply doesn't trust her to do a good job. And I'd like to know, as husband and wife, how this works, because they're both meant to be running this business together. Another poorly managed aspect of the property business is the use of space. Grand rooms are half converted and then abandoned, like the old kitchen at the back of the house. This is something without this horrible mezzanine that could be a marvellous public space. If this became the dining room, it would free up the central area for the charity balls and shift the retirement business to a more discreet part of the house. The Wally's other problem is waste. They're losing £20,000 a month in running costs and Ruth wants to know why. Albury has 18 staff dotted all over the house, including a live-in seamstress, who rearranges the cushions. In the kitchen, the two full-time chefs feed more employees than residents. There's about 18 staff in total, but with the residents, you know, on a daily basis, we're looking at feeding about 30 people. Right. I'm pretty happy that every yeah. day the residents are happy, I'm happy, Nigel's happy. Yeah. And at the end of the day, yeah. that's, that's okay. what I need. So. And in the meantime, they're not making enough money. <laughs> no, exactly. No. This house costs £700,000 a year to run, 60000 of which goes on heating. With soaring energy costs, that figure is only going up. This is stonking around to boilers. He's heating spaces which are absolutely empty. He's heating places which just don't need the level of heat. There's a lot of service charges to cover that. The next morning, Ruth has arranged for a local high-end estate agent to visit Albury. Hello, Paul, hi. Nice to meet you. I'm Ruth, hello. Can we go through it? She wants professional confirmation that just one properly finished flat will help sell the 16 unwanted apartments. Do you think people actually would prefer to walk into a space like this, completely undone, and say, yes, I'd like to have red walls and blue ceilings, or do you think they want to come and look at something that's done? I think the benefit of the show flat is absolute. You can only maximise value when you give the public something it actually wants to buy, something what the person actually wants to live in, and it's very important to understand the end user when you're designing the properties. Before delivering her rescue plan, Ruth heads to nearby London. The Woolies could make Albury into a lucrative wedding venue, but they're reluctant to do so because of their residents. Ruth also thinks Jennifer's charity balls could make £20,000 a year in higher fees alone. High Society events organiser Dora Lowenstein holds her glamorous parties at Sotheby's. Can Dora help Jennifer turn a profit? As I... Um think that you've got to be very clear in your involvement in the charity but be very very clear also that she's running a venue 
and she must maybe pick a price that she's going to charge for that venue, it could be a charitable rate, but stick to it. And whatever she does for the charity must be a voluntary act and not affect the budget that they've set. After three days at Albury, Ruth must tell the Wallies how to save their beloved home. How are you? Breathless, slightly <laughs> breathless. <laughs> You're always breathless, Jennifer. You have dealt with the last four years with incredible incompetence, and I know that there's some justification for it, but I don't want there to be any justification for the future because the bank doesn't care. Ruth's solution to the bank's six-month deadline is to placate them with a grand plan and stop the scattergun approach to development. I would like you to get in a combination of chartered surveyor, property developer, local estate agent, who actually comes and looks at this entire building, surveys it and says, this is how it should be divided up. What I also have taken on board, and which I thought right from the start myself, is that you must have a show flat. They can't imagine the dream. You've got to give them the dream. The only way to pay back the debt is to sell apartments. But Albury is known locally as an old folks' home. Moving the retirees' dining room should help with the rebranding. OK, what do you do with the residents? I've earmarked a space where I think would make a wonderful little restaurant for them, and that's possibly the old kitchen. But as well as their property debt, Nigel and Jennifer are losing a quarter of a million a year just running Albury. They haven't applied basic business practices. I was horrified when Wayne, your chef, said to me that he was given a budget per head, but he never has had to do a margin sheet. It's unheard of. That's our fault for not making him do it then. OK. Well, so if we've got endless staff, which I would really question the validity of keeping on, the needlework, the bits of upholstery, the bloody cushions, they are not making you a penny. They are actually costing you money. You know, it's like you're their aunts and uncles. Yes, and social actually... services. Ruth wants to turn the Wally's good nature into business sense. They're hosting a charity ball in three months, and she'll return to see if they can run it without losing money. At the end of the day, what I see are two very charitable people who have been looking after a great raft of people, very sweetly and very kindly, but who've now become paupers themselves In and the actually mm. in need of huge charitable <laughs> <laughs> endeavour. You know, I mean, you are the ones who need the help, not the people you're helping. It's six weeks since Ruth's visit and Nigel has been busy converting the old kitchen into a new dining room for the retirees. Well, Ruth suggested that actually we ought to change the dining room image, basically, and move them so they weren't so much in your face for people looking around. Um, well, since Ruth was here, um, yes, I, I've never seen my husband move so quickly and, and so efficiently for anybody in his life. Basically, we've said yes to everything because we don't want to be hit around the face with the, with the rubber pipe. Nigel has also taken Ruth's advice to engage architects. The only one we do have a problem with is this small apartment behind here. The architects have advised him to convert his 33 small flats into 20 large apartments to appeal to those younger buyers. The idea is to have this as a, as a sitting room for that apartment there. Yeah, that just goes into a cupboard, that doesn't... Um, As Nigel takes charge of the property development, there, but I think when they put the lift in, okay. Jennifer holds the fort on reception. But there are still no plans for a show flat. to Aubrey for three months and I'm going to be so interested to see how Nigel and Jennifer are getting on. I know they're doing one thing and that's a charity ball in aid of the cheetah and if it's like any of the other things that Jennifer gets up to it will make a huge loss. Something they absolutely can't afford to do. Tonight's charity ball is crucial to see if the Wallies can turn a much needed profit from Aubrey. But first Nigel shows Ruth his progress with the newly relocated dining room. Oh, fantastic. 
fantastic. Once we've finished eventually doing all the meals, then it will go back into being a, an apartment. You mean when these people have gone? Yeah, have, have moved on eventually, yes. But hopefully not just like that, but hopefully you know, they might have to go to a nursing home. So I think most of them would rather wish that they just happened. Mm. <laughs> Ruth's idea for a grand plan has paid off. The bank has bought into it and extended Nigel's six-month deadline. But he still needs to repay the four million. Ruth's unhappy that nothing's been sold and there's no show flat. Not only I, but your uh, existing estate agents felt very strongly that a show flat was an essential part of marketing here. Well, the trouble is, of course, we haven't got one that I can do as a show flat. I mean, you're so kind of laid back. <laughs> may, may I say even sort of slightly complacent about it? Like, it's all going to be all right. And I don't know why you think it's all going to be all right. How do you feel about it? Um, very concerned. Very concerned. I think I'm probably more like you about it. Now, I'm very anxious that we get the thing underway. The thing about Jennifer is, I think she loves me being here because I can crack a whip in a way that she can't and he has to listen to me. I think he wants to shout at me, but he's too polite to do so. I said that seems a bit laid back, but, you know, I try and, try and be calm. I mean, it's no good jumping up and down and rushing around in circles. You have to think about it carefully and, and, and move these things ahead. We are working very hard. I mean, the proverbial duck swimming like mad and a bit looking serene on the top. That's the impression I try to try to give. So <laughs> probably she said I'm more like a goose, I should think, probably, than a, than a duck or a swan, but anyway. With only a few hours to go before the start of the charity ball, Ruth wants proof that the Wallies have changed their wasteful habits and have properly budgeted for tonight's event. You're dressing all the plates. Hi, I won't, oh, yeah. no, I won't, because you probably need your hands. So this is a salmon roulade you're kicking yeah, up here. Yeah, salmon yes. roulade with a little hairdresser. What was your budget for this? Well, we aimed for about twenty-five pound a head. Right, your your costs were going to no, be twenty-five. No, no, sorry, sorry. Um, costs would be about fifteen, maybe fifteen pound a head plus. Right. It's quite, you know, it's an expensive meal. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have so. thought it would be quite as much as £15. Well, maybe not 15 maybe Yeah. Less, but, but, I mean, were you not asked to restrict it to a certain amount? They, they weren't bothered what yes, you spent? It's, it's no. Me, no. Yeah. Hang the cost. Yeah, basically. Okay. I think at the end of the day they wanted to impress. Not only is there no budget for this dinner, which they're <laughs> giving away to everyone, um, but you know, he speculates that the cost of food is £25. No way. Then he goes down to £15. It's probably more like eight. Well, it certainly shouldn't be any more. But the fact is that nobody seems to care about money in this place. It's like it's just footloose and fancy free. Do what you want, spend what you want, eat what you want. Who gives a shit? I think it's ridiculous. So whose decision was it to put the food down first and uh, before the people arrived in their places? OK. Is that because he just wants space in the kitchen? Um, well, no, it makes it nicer for the resident, um, the people that are coming, because otherwise... Why? Because it's easier for us to find out where the vegetarians are straight away. Sorry, I don't get you. Well, if they're all sitting down, um, it finds it harder to find where the vegetarians are. So how do you find out where the vegetarians are now? Uh, name tags. Right. Where are the name tags? Well, they've gone now. They were here. <laughs> so how are the people going to find where they're sitting when they come in? Sure. With no clear plan for this event, will the Wallies ever be able to make their business a success? Champagne through there to start off with. Did you get anybody to help sponsor the champagne? Why I slightly doubt Nigel's ability to pull this off is because the bit he can control, he hasn't been controlling. It's the evening of the Cheetah Ball, and Albury Mansion is beginning to fill up. There's uh, champagne just through there. But Ruth Watson has already found evidence of poor planning and extravagant waste, such as free champagne for everyone. They kissed from one man already tonight. Have so you? Only one man? Only one man, thank God. I'm getting a bit worried. <laughs> <laughs> I'm losing my touch. Bit of a ladies man, Nigel. I think he likes the ladies. <laughs> champagne and lovely women that way, OK? Did you get anybody to help sponsor the champagne? You know, like a supplier? No. 
Albury has the perfect infrastructure for events, with its large kitchen and impressive stately rooms. The Wallies occasionally do weddings, but they limit them because of the disturbance to the elderly residents. Ruth is flummoxed because functions are an obvious way for Albury to generate an income. Something she's learning is not the case with tonight's event. She meets Laurie Marker of the Cheetah Foundation. So if Jennifer and Nigel are sort of giving you the place and the food and the wine, etc., etc., I mean, can they cover their costs? Are you expecting them to do that? They have offered those costs as well as a gift to the Cheetah really? Conservation Fund. Okay, it's amazing. Very generous. Very generous. <laughs> it's amazing. They, they, are, they are not, in, from, to my mind, in a position to be quite so generous as they're being. So, I mean, you wouldn't have minded paying the costs, the overheads of this, and just taken all the extra. Of, profit. Well, of course, but it was whatever they have decided to come up okay, with. So all right. I just want them to be able to afford to be so generous and kind and thoughtful. If we could move, if we could move through, that would be great. Financially, this is a disaster. Ruth now knows the charity balls will never be a revenue source for the Wallies. There's no doubt there's a lot of goodwill around tonight, especially for cheetahs. I'm not sure it's going to do Jennifer and Nigel much good. But the fact of the matter is that this event has not been run with great competence. The next morning, Nigel is out. Ruth takes the opportunity to speak to Jennifer alone to see if she understands the gravity of their situation. It's a notoriously difficult situation, husbands and wives working together. And you have suggested in the past that you only do the menial things. I mean, is that because you choose to, or do you think Nigel doesn't trust you to do any more? I think I fill in. Um, I had my own business, and again, you know, trusted people, which is a ridiculous thing to do in today's world. Um, so that failed. Um, and Nigel sort of rescued me, really. Mm. And but so, rescued in what way? By well, marrying you or yes, by...? Yes, Right. Yes, <laughs> it, was, it was a wonderful rescue not, job. Not by putting money into your business. No, no, no. no, no. Okay. He rescued me, uh, which was a wonderful rescue. Yeah. And um, so I've always wanted to, to please him and to help him. So how would you feel if um, things went horribly wrong and you didn't get the apartments done? soon enough and sold soon enough to satisfy the bank. I'm, I'd be living in a cardboard box with him. <laughs> I, I can't think there and I can't go there. What about the show flat? The show flat, fine. I will do you a show flat if you want a show but flat. But Nigel doesn't want a show flat. Um, I'm sure he won't resist if I ask him for a show flat. I'm sure we can put a show flat together for yeah. you. Yes. You keep saying for me. I don't want it for me. I want but it fine. for you. <laughs> I will accept that you're right <laughs> again and we'll make a show flat. I'll, I'll talk to him about a show flat when he gets back. A show flat and an open day to promote it would be a step forward. But the retirement business is still losing £20,000 a month and Ruth wants Jennifer to take control. I think that the two things that absolutely need to happen are one, to control the costs that exist right now with the setup you have right now. And that's obviously to do with the staff you employ, the services you provide, particularly the food, but whether it's the, the lighting, heating, all those kind of aspects of it. And that is very, very easy to do. And that's, the, that's my problem about why I slightly doubt Nigel's ability to pull this off, is because the bit he can control he hasn't been controlling. Right. So it may be that you are going to have to control the bit that you can control and let him carry on with the development bit. And you make the bit that's here and now work. Right. Because that would at least give you positive cash flow as opposed to a negative one that you have now. Mm. I think you're absolutely right. Mm. Is there anything you want to say to me? Because I... I... Don't do no? I don't want to make you cry.
While I completely understand Jennifer's loyalty to Nigel, um, he is her husband after all, it's really distressing because she obviously knows things are wrong and the fact is that she's relatively powerless to do anything about it. As a woman, I sometimes think we haven't come a long way, baby. It's July and Ruth's pep talk has done the job. Jennifer has persuaded Nigel to create a show flat. But there's just 10 days left until the open day. Nigel's very worried about it, uh, just being ready, because, you know, Ruth sort of um, has her uh, piece of rubber hose for him. <laughs> well, this is going to be the drawing room of our show apartment. Uh, as you know, we've only got a short time to do it, uh, and blind panic is, is setting in. The plan is to create a large ground floor show flat from three small apartments. And this will be the main entrance. We've put a doorway in here, uh, which, as you can see, is uh, a long way to go. The curtains, as you can see, are just wonderful. And these are just a beautiful, beautiful silk. Um, and we're going to make those with the sort of Georgian stringing, so they meet in the middle and are pulled back high. They enhance the Georgian windows, and they'll drop well on the floor and puddle onto the floor. Look very, very elegant. Despite Mr Brown, and despite the credit crunch, and despite the Chancellor, and despite all the gloom and doom that's in the papers, um, we're full of hope. Nine days later, and it's the eve of Albury's open day. Ruth is back for her final visit. The house now has a show flat to complement its revived image. It features a drawing room, two bedrooms, two bathrooms, an as yet unfinished kitchen, and a sitting room in what was the old dairy. Despite the transformation, the Wallies are nervous about Ruth's return. Nigel said this morning that he, when, with the advent of Ruth, he was going to wire the cattle grid. <laughs> no, no, it'd be, it'll, it'll be fine. I'm sure she'll be, um, yeah, she'll be more gentle on me this week. <laughs> Please, God. <laughs> oh! They've changed the boards for a woolly version of Brighton Beach. <laughs> Hello? And look at my dear, our sofas have just arrived. Mm. Just arrived. Very good. Aren't they wonderful? So this is part of the new show flat? This is the main part. Well, yes, I mean, the, the, the main drawing. part. Yes, the drawing. Well, I have to say, I think you've done the most amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. I really do. <laughs> because I tell you what, it's very neutral, but that's very clever. Yes. Because what you don't want is to frighten the horses. And it looks immensely elegant and it suits the room, and how much better to show somebody this than one of those cruddy, half-done rooms with a bit of old bathroom yes. hanging around and a not-quite-completed yes. kitchen and yes. bare walls and... Yes, 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 yes. I mean, this is, this is selling Aubrey. Yes, it is wonderful, Well isn't done, it? you. Thank you. Cost? Well, there is more. Table cost me £10, so we stripped it and, and, and painted it yes. and antiqued it. The only new things are the sofas. Yeah. The mirror we moved out of the reception area. Yes. And the fireplace you put in, didn't you? That we put wasn't the fireplace there. in. Yeah, we found, that looks yes. very expensive. Uh, well, that was half a low-budget fireplace, so right. we did terribly well on it. Jennifer has changed her ways and brought the show flat in on budget. Nigel. Hello. Ah. Hello. Hello. How are you? How are you? How are you? I'm well. Yeah. You? I have just been admiring your wife's magnificent work. It's lovely. She's done a wonderful job, hasn't she? She really I hope has. you think so. I do think so. Yeah. Well, let's hope we get a sale from it. But can I see the rest of it? Because I've just yes, walked past the Yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah? of course. Well, this is the master bedroom. Now, when we saw this earlier with Mr Nixon, I think his name was? Mm, the yes, indeed. That came That's around right, that time. Yeah. Now, this was... It was just this part that was the flat, wasn't it? With the bit down there. With the bit down the end. That's yeah, right. so yes, it's yeah. actually gained a very nice okay. lobby and that fantastic room. Absolutely. We've actually joined three apartments together. And a to huge kitchen. Mm -hmm. He might have had it if might it had been like this. Yeah. I mean, the great thing about this is that having a show flat, you know, you're just giving people an yeah. idea of how life could Absolutely. be here. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't disagree and with that at all. Jennifer's going to put her finishing touches in. Oh, yeah, there's later quite a bit more to do for tomorrow yet, yeah. so we're going to be at it yeah. till midnight. But even working late, Nigel's builders won't have time to fit the kitchen. Luckily, 
Ruth has a bright idea. You could turn this on its head and say, you know, the fact is that anyone putting in a bid for this, we can do the kitchen any way you like. So you could turn a minus into a plus. I mean, I think, you know, the things you've really hit on the head is, is doing a show flat at all, increasing the space. All I want to see, and I'm not going to keep nagging about it, but I will, is reduction on costs as well. That would be yeah, they are going in the right direction. Oh, yeah, okay. they're definitely going in the right direction. And so that's good. But more pats than oh, smacks. Oh, good. Oh, that makes a change. <laughs> It's the morning of the open day at Albury Park. Hello, morning. How, How are you? Lovely to see you. How are you? We're well. Are, We're you, well, are you prepared? You. <laughs> uh, we hope so. It yeah. depends what you say to us. <laughs> but we hope so, yes. We've done really It's well, all looking good. It's all looking good, we yeah. think. Hi, good morning. Nigel Wally, how do you do? <laughs> it's, the, it's the quality I'm looking for. So, basically, this would be your front door, right. and this would be your hallway. The two-bedroom show flat is for sale at £900,000. I just knew it as retirement apartments. I had no idea that there was any possibility of, of it being sold as, as individual properties. I thought it was a nursing home, to be honest, and I thought it might be a bit kind of... Happy. Estate agent Tim and his team are showing potential buyers other unrenovated apartments. Anyway, let me take anyway, you. Thank you very much. Lovely. But only once they've seen the show flat and have the crucial knowledge of what the apartments will look like when finished. It's quite difficult to envisage the grand plan as such without having something like that to sort of bring you back into into focus, so yeah. to speak. And it's important to see that first because then that is in your mind as you go around. So you've got more people, got more people coming? Yes. Hi, I'm Nigel Wally. Hello. So my budget was this big, and as always, my husband's was this big. But I did it. I did it. <laughs> so it's lunch hour now, and a lot of people have come through to have champagne and some very nice looking nibbles and smoked salmon sandwiches and things. My only question mark is why are they putting this spread on here? It's the inner core of the house, the least attractive part of Albury. They could have actually been doing it in one of the fine drawing rooms or out on the terrace even. I think they've missed a trick here. Despite Ruth's reservations, the open day has gone well. It's, it's something that we, we're, we're definitely going to consider, isn't it? It's going to demand a big conversation between us. <laughs> yeah, I think I know which one I would. <laughs> and with the help of the show flat, prospective buyers can visualise the grand plan for all 20 luxury apartments. They're different, they're unique, they're interesting, they've got a lot of history, they tell a story, people then they have visitors, they've got lots to tell them about and show them around and, you know, they don't need to get in a car and drive to go for a country walk. They can literally hop out into the garden and they've got acres of land to walk around and, and sort of show off, really. <laughs> <laughs> So that seemed to be like a very busy morning and all enjoying their champagne. How do you think it um, went? It was a very good day. Very, very well worthwhile doing. We've probably got two people who are very serious about this one. Okay. We have a lady who is very interested in the gatehouse, wants to come and see it when it's finished. And we've got two people who are very interested in the muse apartments from rental perspectives. This property has been, for a better word, blighted by local knowledge, local opinion as to what it was used for. Um, today we've brought people in who think it's a retirement home. It isn't. Mm. And hopefully from there they'll go and spread the word. Mm. And the show flat really seemed to perform very well, didn't it? Yes, you, you're absolutely right. It's what we needed here. We really needed it for the, for the marketing and it's, um, everybody's loved it. Mm. Um, whether they want this size or not, it's given the, 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 the quality of the place, I think, yeah. as Sean It's through. an indicator, isn't it? Yes, yeah. absolutely, what we can do. The show flat has sold Albury to a new market. The Wallies still need to reduce their running costs, but they now have a clear plan that could help them pull themselves out of their financial nightmare. What I think has been the greatest achievement is that you no longer are tinkering with a number of different things. You've got one clear goal, and that is to sell the apartments here. And I didn't get that feeling before. But I do feel that you treated Jennifer a little bit as a very pretty decoration, but rather than a very useful member of the team. And I think Jennifer has actually shown that, you know, she is an incredible 
good asset to Aubrey because she's actually shown people what Aubrey can look like. No, absolutely. I mean, this is what we were sort of aiming to do, to be honest, when we have the money and everything else. I mean, it is a, it is a slow process. But I, I think also that with Ruth, the advent of Ruth we, has brought such hope and such possibilities. And so that's inspired me on, on my own, that we really can accomplish this and achieve it. Today has been incredibly encouraging. And as long as you continue on this trail, and I'm sure you will, then I see no reason at all why Aubrey shouldn't be a huge success story. And the idea of you living here without any of the worries that mm. you've had in the past, I mean, you know, it can only be, be a marvellous picture. Yes, it will Absolutely. be wonderful, Ruth. Mm. Absolutely wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Twelve months on, and have the Wallies done enough to save their home and impress Ruth? When the property market crashed, I did think that you were in the most vulnerable position. One year on, and Albury Park has been totally reinvented. When Ruth left the Wallies, they were gearing up to sell Albury's exclusive apartments and reap the rewards. But no one could have predicted the severity of the year to come, with the economy plummeting to a record low. House prices were at their worst for 30 years. The crisis could have been the end of Albury Park, but, inspired by Ruth's early observations that Albury had potential as a wedding venue, Jennifer has risen to the challenge. Is the arm right like that? Yeah, that, that, that the arm's good yeah, like that? Yeah. Just, just relax, relax your hand, Tom. So this is just for our website, and uh, we've got some horses on there already, and now we wanted the rolls on, uh, just to show Albury really at its best. That's great. <laughs> With only five elderly residents remaining at Albury come Park, on, the, the Wallies have been able to pursue Ruth's idea of turning this historic house into a prestigious wedding venue. It's really pretty. It's very good to see you again. And of course, the burning question is, after I left, what happened? <laughs> when you left us, we were full of hope. And of course, that was dashed very quickly when the economy dropped. And it was a very grim couple of days for us. And then Nigel, who normally makes me laugh in the morning before we get out of bed, actually dug me in the ribs this particular morning and he said, oh, darling, I told the bank yesterday you'll do 80 weddings next year. And so I had a swift chat with the ceiling and I thought about you. And what came into my mind was your comment, which was, make this into the wedding venue of Surrey. And I thought, right, that's what I've got to do. Orby Park. Jennifer has taken the lead in the new venture and has found that she has a real talent for closing the deal. They have an incredible 75 weddings on their books, which is keeping them and the bank happy. Um, we have availability in July, but unfortunately not on the Saturdays. Were you committed to a Saturday? Do you actually feel that you've now got a proper job? Because, you know, initially it was very much, it was Nigel's baby and you were kind of worrying in the background, but didn't feel that there was anything you could do to mm. ameliorate and the situation. I don't feel such a burden on Nigel's shoulders now. I feel that I'm actually promoting something that is supporting him. So that's worked well. And, and Nigel, you, you, you feel that Jennifer doing this wedding thing is... Yeah. It, yeah, I mean, she's, she's just brilliant at, at selling them, as you can imagine, you know, she sells them the whole package. It is absolutely magical, and, and our couples now travel down this little garden path, this winding garden path, and there are primroses and bluebells, snowdrops, and then they go into this wonderful thousand-year-old church, and they're going to have a flute, they can have a violin, they can have cow parsley strewn. You've sold me, I'll get married. Sorry, <laughs> I'll do it all over again. <laughs> The weddings are a temporary fix until sales of the refurbished apartments pick up. So presumably what's happened is that the weddings have provided enough cash flow to service the bank and that sort of shut them up, has it? Oh, absolutely. They've actually been very supportive recently. Uh, once they found we had a sort of second source of income, that's made all the difference to them. Uh, and it's worked pretty well so far. I mean, it's... Only hard work yes. in keeping it going. Um, but now we're starting to sell the apartments as well. Um, so it, it, it really looks better and better, to be honest. Well, obviously, plan A was of, to do up the apartments and get them sold. So specifically, since I last saw you, how many have you sold? We've sold the show flat. And we have... Uh, sold the show flat? Show the, <laughs> sold the show flat, yes. So... Um, 
Yes, I know you didn't want us to do that, but well, no, to be no, no, honest, in, the, in this market, what, would it, what else would no, you no, do? No, 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 listen, show? you have to sell anything you can, but you do need to do another show yes, flat. We will. we will. When Ruth first came to Albury, the heating bill was £60,000 a year. That's now been reduced to less than 30000 and they've saved £16,000 on staff costs. Bringing in Master Chef Kevin Hooper has helped them rein in costs for functions. I basically get all the food in, get all the staff in and make sure that everything is on budget, that everything goes out on time and that the quality is what people would want to see for a wedding. It is possible to lose money on weddings uh, if you don't plan properly. Are you making sure that you are in charge of the overhead there? And Yes, and I'm learning as I go, of course, and we started at a very, very reasonable rate. So we started this year at 3,500 plus fat for the venue. I still think that even 4,000 is for the run of the very house good. and the grounds yeah. and having the blessing in the chapel it sounds to me on, on the low side. Mm. Um, because if there is more money to be made out of them, then we you should to. be. <laughs> we do need to. But success and cutting costs has another consequence. As always, we found something left over. Now there are fewer staff to help out. It's the Wallies who are often left to clean up. On the Sunday, we were literally washing up all day. And by Monday morning, I was so stiff that I, I could not reach my feet. I swore that my legs had grown another foot. <laughs> and I was trying, I was throwing my sock up in the air to try and get it on, because there was no way I could get near my feet. We were just so tired and so stiff. Oh, someone's left a tip. <laughs> 50, 70, 73p. We make a profit this week then. <laughs> The Wallies have survived the global downturn right, and continue to make Albury pay its way. I'd just like to say that despite all the odds, because as I say, when the property market crashed and all the troubles came out of the woodwork with the financial world, I did think that you were in the most vulnerable position because I wouldn't have been at all surprised to have got a phone call saying, we you can't. know, the bank's foreclosed, we've, we've got to go. And it's all credit to you two that you haven't had that happen. Well, thank you. Very Thanks good. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. This is Blacklochry in Galloway, West Scotland. Adrian and Caroline Goodall bought the remote house so they could escape the rat race with their family. But their ideal home soon turned into a money pit and the strain was taking its toll on their relationship. Caroline, we've sat down and argued the toss. What about separating? Last year, businesswoman Ruth Watson came to rescue this national treasure and save the couple's dream. Where's the preparation? This is just not good enough. I think she's really brought it home to me. Just, what a bloody pickle I'm in. One year on, has Ruth's hard-hitting advice had an impact on Adrian and Caroline? Perhaps one or two houses are worth a divorce, but certainly not Black Lockery. South Ayrshire, Scotland. In this wild and beautiful landscape bordering the Galloway Hills and Forest Park lies Blacklochry House. Built in 1901 in the arts and crafts style, Blacklochry was originally a hunting lodge designed for leisure and country pursuits. Four years ago, builder Adrian Goodall fell in love with this remote spot and decided to relocate his family from Halifax in Yorkshire. His partner Caroline, her son Rob, and their daughter Georgie left their busy lives behind to start again in this secluded part of Scotland. When we came up to the house, uh, it was just like entering a fairy tale, really. We couldn't believe, actually, how big it was. It was beyond really being able to comprehend it and see it realistically as your own. It's just a dream. 
Adrian and Caroline paid £680,000 for Blacklochry, but it soon became clear that beneath the surface there were fundamental and costly problems. We got to a point where we stopped adding the figures up because it was getting quite depressing. They couldn't afford to keep Blacklochry as a private home, so they decided to let the eight-bedroom house out to self-catering groups. We are not hoteliers, we're not hospitality people. We've stumbled on this and done this out of necessity. Now the Goodalls have had to move into a tiny adjacent cottage, which was the old servants' quarters, while the house lies empty, waiting for guests that rarely come. Last year, they only made an £8,000 profit, and this year, things are even worse. To make ends meet, Adrian and his stepson Rob have had to take on contracting work for local farmers, which means long hours away from the house. It's been extremely difficult. When I'm here on my own, I really do wonder, what the hell am I doing here? They are working harder than ever, seeing less of each other and not even living in the house that brought them here. Ruth is on her way to Blacklochry to help Adrian and Caroline save their dream. If she can find them. I really don't know whether I'm heading in the right direction. I know Blacklochry is a long way off the main road, but I'd really like to see some reassuring signs, especially when I get to what's effectively a little crossroads. So good. Oh, hello, Rose. Nice to meet you. Oh, this is amazing. The wood panelled hallway is a perfect example of the arts and crafts movement. Simple, unified designs and good craftsmanship. Is he a relation? Uh, he was a gift from my father. Do you know anything about arts and crafts? I'm not, not judging by that response, no! <laughs> there are many wonderful examples of arts and crafts features. The hand-beaten fireplace around in the dining room is typical of the movement. I love to sit down in here, get the fire going and have dinner at the table. But I thought you lived outside in one of the cottages. Yes, but the cottage is actually attached to the main house. Oh, right. But you don't live upstairs, sleep upstairs? No. 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 Is that a bit odd, to have bought this wonderful place and then not live in it yourself? It is, really, isn't yeah. it? It's, it's the problem of having to keep coming in and cleaning it, changing the beds, the linen, and things yes. like that. We've got guests yeah. coming in. But does that make you feel a bit like the concierge rather than the owners? It does, just for <laughs> me. Despite Adrian doing much of the work himself, the Goodalls have spent £150,000 restoring the house. And there's still a great deal more to do. The joinery works um, are all collapsing in the corners. There's water getting in. This is too important to lose, I think. It's yes. really, it really lovely. But Adrian can't finish the renovations Blacklochery so desperately needs because all his time is taken up with the farm contracting work. This is not what they'd planned. What brought you from Yorkshire to the lowlands of Scotland? Well, I had, a, I had a bad accident. Um, right. When I was uh, running my business, I severed my left foot. Um, then I had a double brain hemorrhage. What is this? What? I mean, this is horrendous. Yes, this, yeah, it is. And how, yeah. I mean, is, have you got a foot, may I Yes, ask? I've got a full foot. I've got full use of my foot. And they got your brain back together as well? Uh, yes, they? yes, unfortunately. <laughs> That's debatable. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did it kind of make you stop and take stock of your life and what you were doing with it? Definitely. Definitely did, yeah. Mm, Definitely yeah. did. We decided, you know, um, we'd have a change, complete change of lifestyle. Mm, slow down. Slow down and that move on to aim. something else. That was the aim. Yes. But you haven't slowed down. We're yeah. actually yeah. at it harder than ever. Yeah. So you're looking at an incredibly busy season where you're going to be working all hours out on mm -hmm. the land. In the meantime, nothing gets done on the house, yes? You are in a bit of a catch-22. We are. Yeah, and do you and Caroline think 
alike on this. No, you don't, no. obviously. No. One <laughs> shaky head, <laughs> one <laughs> eyebrows raised. Raging rounds. <laughs> OK. Well, well, in, in what, why? Um, I would... I get frustrated. I would just like to see more of Adrian's talent and skill put into the house. Here? Yes. Not out there in a field yeah. somewhere. Oh, so when you get to the end of the row, is there ever any resolution? There was one resolution. That was to give you a call. <laughs> <laughs> the Goodalls have to find a way to make Black Lochery pay for itself. But time is running out. Adrian's never here. He's never here? No, he's never here. I can't get there on my own. It's frustrating. It would destroy me if I ever lost it. It would take something away from me. Five years ago, Adrian and Caroline Goodall bought Blacklochery House in South Ayrshire, Scotland. The house has some fine arts and crafts features, an impressive wood-panelled hall, handmade fireplaces, and a ballroom with a vaulted ceiling and minstrels gallery. Built in 1901, this fine hunting lodge would have been the country bolt hole of a wealthy family, with the once 7,500-acre estate ideal for country pursuits. But Blacklochry's glory days seem to be over. The splendid house is failing to attract paying guests, and its new owners risk losing their home and their Scottish dream. It would destroy me if I ever lost it. I'd, if I ever had to give it up, it would, you know, it would... It would take something away from me. Ruth continues her investigative tour to try and figure out their best way forward. This is really great. See if there was no other reason for buying the house, it has to be this. You really do get that feeling that this is where you escape to after mm. dinner to have some fun. Mm -hmm. Something you don't do enough of, I think. Not when at the moment. No. Adrian's never here, so... He's never know, here? No, he's never here. I'm busy contracting and things like that, so... I think you should remember what this house is about. Having Pleasure. fun. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Adrian and his stepson, Rob, show Ruth one of the four dilapidated outbuildings in the grounds. This, Ruth, is the uh, original Victorian laundry, where they used to come up and do the laundry for the main house. Amazing. So it's got all the ovens and sinks next door. And a very nice space, all bit slightly tumbly down. And this year uh, was actually part of the steam room, where... Look at that. The clothes were hung on. Just extraordinary. If renovated and let, these could net the Goodalls up to £60,000 a year. Then the family could move back into the main house full time. But for now, they're forced to live in the servants' wing, next to the main house, where Caroline has her office. Caroline used to be a graphic designer and helped put Blacklockery's website together. What I'm really surprised about is that the look and feel of it is really quite old-fashioned. I mean, this typeface, for example. Yes. I mean, I personally hate this font that's been used because I think it's, rather than looking traditional, I think it just looks sort of dated. I'm afraid I think this looks a bit amateur night out. Not doing it justice, am I? No, not really. But when you're here on your own, which is quite a lot, and yes. Adrian's out on the tractor and perhaps Rob's out as well, I mean, do you sometimes wonder why you're here? Yes, I do. I do. Mm. So why do you think Adrian prefers to be away from the house rather than in the house refurbishing it? I think, I think he sees the potential and he knows that it needs to be done. Mm. But he doesn't, in my mind, he doesn't really appreciate the urgency and just how much potential there is here now, mm. how much money can be made here. Mm. I can't get there on my own, it's frustrating. Ruth has a look around the rest of the house on her own to check out the facilities they are currently offering guests. This is amazing. I've seen a few fireplaces in my life, but never one like this. It's just the most amazing piece of design, unlike the Draylon headboard. Apart from the master bedroom with ensuite, 
the other seven bedrooms have to share just two bathrooms, one of which has an original Victorian shower bath, a fascinating period piece, but hardly a mod con. If the Goodalls want to up their bookings, charge more and encourage return visits, they will need to raise their game. Now, here's the problem with this house. Everywhere I go, there's this nice, simple, strict arts and crafts interior. And yet, appliqued on top is all this rubbish. We have a little spriggy wallpaper from the 70s, and then we've got lilac duvets and pink bedside tables and ghastly lamps. If you haven't got any money, the best thing is just to keep it very simple, just keep it white. It's all wrong. Such a mismatch. Blacklochry borders the Galloway Forest Park, which at 300 square miles is the largest in Britain. But despite living just yards from it, the Goodalls have never visited. Ruth has arranged to meet Keith Muir, the park's head of tourism, to see if Blacklochry's remote, undiscovered location could be the key to its success. So at the moment, how many visitors are you getting and how many would you like to get? We're getting around about a million just now, and we'd like to get in excess of 1.5 million. Really? Are you getting the right kind of lodgings for people? Do you think that could be improved? Definitely could be improved. We need the private businesses to come on board and offer something that the visitor wants to come to. So yeah. getting the accommodation right is critical to us. It's clear that Caroline and Adrian should be doing more to exploit their location. And that's not the only trick they're missing. Arts and crafts accommodation can be big business. Bob and Isabel Hunter, owners of Skirling House near Dumfries, have welcomed thousands of design-conscious guests to their unique and very popular B&B. It's charming, isn't it? But even with all the history, some modern touches are required. All the bedrooms at Skirling House are en suite. What I love is the basin and things are obviously demonstrably old, but the, but the overhead shower looks spanking new, so I like it the... Is. It is. I think everybody wants at least as good as they have at home, Absolutely. and if you can give them something yeah. that they thought they would do but haven't quite got round to doing yet at yes. home, that's even better. Yeah. You've got to exceed their expectations yeah, if you possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. You're stealing my words. I do. <laughs> <laughs> After her investigations, Ruth returns to Blacklochry to give the Goodalls her assessment. I'm feeling so nervous. Hello, everyone. Hi, Hi. Ruth. Hello, Ruth. Top of the agenda, the poor directions for guests negotiating the four miles of track leading to the house. I'm going to start my experience right from the beginning, and that's... As I drove off the road, what I really found missing was signage, because as I went on and on and on and on, I wanted some reassurance that I was on the right track, literally. Next up, the house itself. Ruth feels they're not making the most of Blacklochery's unique selling point, its arts and crafts style. With the best will in the world, some of the furnishings, paintings, pictures, it's not really in keeping. The architecture is very strong and plain and simple, and you're putting in sort of rather fussy things and things which don't really go. Mm. The other problem with the house itself is that there is a deficiency of bathrooms. I think you should install at least one or two. At the moment, the Goodalls only have four bookings for the year ahead. Ruth thinks they should be tapping into the tremendous resource that they have on their doorstep. The Galloway Forest Park, which is stupendously beautiful, they've got 600 miles of tracks there, and they would be more than happy for you to take your guests out there on mini safaris, and they could be themed. I mean, they could be people who want to do photography, it could be people who want to go fishing, people who want to do walking. So you could be the tour guide, the host. I mean, don't you think you might enjoy that? You I've, ne it. I've never actually thought of that, to you be honest. You would love it's it, just... Adrian, and you'd be very good at it. I do love this countryside here. It's just fabulous. You know? it, it was just taking people around the garden and just showing them little fishing spots and stuff. He loves it. Yeah. What Adrian would really love is to move back into the main house, and renovating the cottages for holiday lets could be the best way to achieve this. 
But nothing will get done unless Adrian can find the time from his busy farming schedule. What I want to suggest is that Rob takes over with you overseeing all of the contracts, so some income coming in from there, but that frees you up, Adrian, to be here on site with your beloved wife, who misses you, that you start to enjoy being here more, that this becomes your main core activity. Yep. Yeah? Right. Yep, I'd agree with that. I can't see how this house will ever, ever get the treatment and the attention it deserves. Right. It's not going to happen, because right. at the moment, you're investing all your time and energy elsewhere. Yep. And that's the truth of it. But what you're doing is actually saying stuff black clockery. Mm. Because yes. nobody else is going to do the work here. It could be said that you're being very selfish about it. It seems to be all about me and what I'm doing. What about everybody else? Well, it is to some extent all about you because you're the one who's dictating what happens here by your absence. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with that. And I don't mean it in a bad way, but sometimes you're just so engrossed in your work, you just can't see out and see what's happening to the rest of us. And it's a shame. I didn't want you to appear quite so depressed. You're making the farmers happy. And I want you to make you happy, and your family happy, and this house happy. So it sort of is all about you. When somebody comes and tells you who's an outsider, knows nothing of my circumstances, nothing of the position we're in or anything, who then lays it on the line to you. I think she's really, really brought it home to me. Just what a bloody pickle I'm in. After Ruth left, Adrian was up very late to the early hours of the morning contemplating everything that Ruth had said. And the next morning he came to the conclusion that we should just sell the bloody thing because they just can't do it. It can't be in five places at one time. It took a, a few days of talking to him and, you know, a bit of reality. And he came round to it and he's decided, yes, we'll do it. You know, her comments sort of made me think, well, have I done the wrong thing? It's all about, you know, nurturing this house and making it, you know, somewhere special for us. It's a special place and I'd hate to lose it, I'd hate to give it up. I just love it here, just absolutely love it. It's May, four weeks since Ruth Watson's first visit to Black Lochry, and she's on her way back to see if the Goodalls have taken on her advice. One key suggestion was that they install proper signage to help potential customers find their remote house. Hello. Hello, Ray. This is very unexpected. Yes. Hi. Nice to see you again. How are you? Now, you know you're doing this all wrong, don't you? Are we? Because who's going to see it at this angle? Well, got yes. to, it's traffic you're looking at, yes. not passers-by. You don't get bloody yes. passers-by. No. Traffic, so it's either got to be facing that way or facing that way, yes. preferably both ways. But side on to the road. Where's Adrian? Adrian's up at the house. He's okay. been out this morning doing a bit of. Um, Don't tell tractor. me on a bloody tractor. Yes. Shall I see you all up there? Yes. Yeah. 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 Anyway, yes, we'll good, good to see progress, though. Well Thank done on you. that, really. Since Ruth's last visit, Caroline has been busy researching the history of the house and the arts and crafts period. So, what have you been doing? I've been concentrating on a logo, and this is actually a rubbing from the ironwork around the ballroom. And then I found some... So, Caroline, the graphic designer, has come out. Yes, <laughs> I'm alive again. Ah. Ruth also advised Adrian to hand over more responsibility for the farm contracts to stepson Rob. 
But with the advent of the busy part of farming season, Adrian's not spending any time working on the renovations at Blacklochry. You know, we're just coming up to as busy as period. The next four months is harvesting time. We've got silage making, and then we come onto the barley and the baling of the straw and all the rest of and it. And how's so Rob been? Um, I think come end of September, when he's really um, been pushed to the fore and pushed to the limits, because it will get really busy from now on. I'll be able to get a feel of whether he's going to be. So able the to true with test it. is oh, coming. Oh, you the think? true test is really, really coming, yeah, and yeah. there may be some big fights, some big arguments. Who knows? But you know, how how's Caroline getting on with her bits and pieces? Well, Caroline's been beavering away. Mm. It's um, it's just took over a mindset. It's why are you uh, shaking your head? Because I come home at night and it's Adrian. Can you do this, Adrian? Can you do that? I've already done a sixteen-hour day, and then I'm getting piled on with pressure. So, so you're worried Caroline's rushing headlong? Well. I'm worried in that there are not enough hours in the day for me. Mm. If, if Robert can take on this contracting, that will free up a lot of my time. Yeah. I can oversee what's going but on. That, and that's then... the thing. That's the thing, Adrian. I mean, you know, this was all about quality of your life, yours and Caroline's, yeah. and to enjoy this house and it to be your house. Yep, that's and right. that's the simple thing. And I don't want it to stress any of you out. The life they dreamed of is evaporating fast. Something's got to change. We might as well just, you know, go separate ways and... What do you mean by saying something like that? Caroline, we've sat down and argued the toss. What about separating? Adrian and Caroline Goodall desperately need to generate an income at Blacklochry. Ruth Watson is keen to find out if they have what it takes to make the accommodation business work. But first, they have to sort out a few teamwork issues. I don't think I need to be either clairvoyant or particularly sensitive. Um, there's something out of kilter here, isn't there, with the way you're both approaching this particular project at this house. Yeah? <laughs> it's deafening silence. I think what we've got to do here is to, you know, bring back some equilibrium. You know, you've got to understand each other. I mean, I want you to understand Caroline is, you know, now feeling so positive, which is a great thing. Well, you want to harness well, took, that, you know. It took two years to get her to this point. What did you just say that made Caroline look like that? What did you just say? It's taken two years to get Caroline to this point. Yeah, well, it has. I have been working my socks off trying to push this place. But not so long ago, you wanted to sell it. Yes, I did, because I don't have the support. I completely see where you're both coming from, right? Yes. I don't have a problem with seeing both your points of view. I completely understand that you've been trying to create a living from another source and you've made commitments to that and you feel that, as the breadwinner, you've got to pursue it. Again... Well, I, don't, it... I don't know whether I feel like I'm the breadwinner. I just feel that, you know... It gives me an opportunity to get out of the way, listening to Caroline going on at me and putting pressure on me to get on with the house. You've it's just, a... it's just the constant. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Look, we've got to get some stability back into this, haven't we? It's like, you know, you're both great people and you both want the best for Black Lockery, but it's going off all at sixes and sevens. And I think you've got to, at some stage, draw a line under everything that's gone on before because it's negative and it's not going to get you going forward. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things about this house is I think it can bring you back together and to have an enjoyable time with it. Adrian and Caroline bought Blacklochry to spend more time together, but instead it's pulling them apart. Ruth has a plan to see if running the house as a business is really something they can enjoy working on together. I'd like to do a little trial about what it would be like to have people sharing this house. And I think if Caroline could get the house up to proper arts and crafts standard, and you, Adrian, taking them off on safari in the Galloway National Park. You get some fun back that's to do with the house. Your relationship gets stronger because you're both going in the same direction and it's on the same project. And there's a, there's a mutual satisfaction to be had from that. And, and even if that didn't and can't work, I mean, for God's sake, you've got to plan some days, Adrian, where you and Caroline just go out and have a good time. You know, sod the silage. It's more important. You know, you love each other. You've got a family. It's commitment. 
you know, we've got, we're making a commitment to, to get things sorted out. If not, we might as well just, you know, go separate ways and, you know... Let's not go our separate ways. That what do you be... mean by saying something like that? This is the first I've heard no, this. No, it isn't. We, we, Caroline, we've sat down and argued the toss over and over again over stuff. Um, just... But all people married yeah. do. What about separating? Oh. Every marriage goes through stages where they're out of kilter. This yes, is I so agree. bloody normal, I can't tell you. Yes. And you will... Talk and shout and fight your way through it and you will be better for it at the end of it, right? But you have to have some fun along the way. You have to have a goal that you're trying to reach because the last thing Black Lockery needs is a divorce, mm -hmm. isn't it? If Adrian can't find time to help, Caroline won't be able to get the house ready. And if things don't change, it seems there's little chance of a future for them at Black Lockery. But with the guests arriving in four weeks, Adrian makes time to build a new bathroom. And, more importantly, he and Caroline are doing it together. What I want is this tile to go up the wall like that. So you just want right? straight lines of tiles and, and up, then... And straight up, yeah. Straight up the wall as well, right. All right. Yep. Thank you, I think that'll look lovely. Yeah, so do I. The busy farming season continues in earnest, and with Rob's help, Adrian keeps on top of the workload. But he still has to make a decision about Black Lochry and his family's future. I've really got to look at my situation very closely and try and see what I do want out of life. Do I want my family, my wife, my kids and this home, or do I want to just spend my time driving tractors in solitude? Adrian wants to follow Ruth's advice and even manages to take a rare afternoon off to prepare for the photographer's safari in the Galloway Forest. He and Caroline head into the park to find some photogenic locations. This has not been used for a long time. It seems so to you look, look over there seems, now. Seems, yeah, that's a fair view, but it's a view just of trees. <laughs> What's this? Lock Scallock. So we've got to there at the moment. That's the house. Yep. There's some stunning views here, wasn't there? Yep. Around a million people visit the forest park each year, and they all need somewhere to stay. If the Goodalls can tap into this market, they may just keep their dream alive. Oh, look at the view now. Our house must be straight over the back of that lock there, down to White Clockery and then into Black Clockery itself. Well, this is absolutely stunning scenery. Mm. Um, I do wonder whether it's what I want to be doing, whether I can uh, feel like I could give my contracting up to do this. And Wouldn't it be a nice way to earn a living? Well, yeah, it probably would. Probably a lot, a lot less stressful, I think. Um, it's whether I could... Uh, fall into this sort of way of life. I don't yeah. know. You'd be great at it, Adrian. I, I think we've, we've got a lot more groundwork to do yet. I think we need to, you know, really research all the tracks and everywhere, you know, all the areas so that we can, we've got a good understanding of what we're trying to offer. What a nice thing to be doing, Adrian, well, and having time together. Yeah, well, yeah, there is that. You know. There is that, having the time together. Mm. Nice to see you, actually. Is it? I've forgotten what you look like. Have you? Yeah. It's four months since Ruth's first visit to Black Lochry, and she's back. Caroline's redecorated the bedrooms in preparation for their first safari weekend. Instead of a riot of clashing designs, simple white walls now complement the arts and crafts details. Caroline's keen to show off her work, especially the bathroom they've worked so hard to finish on time. Well done. Well, it's a bit of a transformation, isn't it? It is, yes. We've ripped out all the walls, the ceiling. It was horrendous, the mm. job. I mean, is it actually ready for action, though? It is, I'm just looking yes. there and thinking that doesn't look yeah. quite right. No, we've plumbed into the existing plumbing. Mm -hmm. And Adrian could absolutely kick himself because we've got a bit of a block in the pipe. 
But Adrian hasn't had time to fix the blockage because his workload has suddenly doubled overnight. What's happened about Rob helping him with the old um, machinery and the contracting? It's, it's not worked out. I really? think they've both come to the conclusion it's not going to work. Um, so Rob's gone his way and Adrian's just muddling along at the moment on his so own. So how's he coping on his own, though? Because I thought he said he wouldn't be able to. Very, very long hours, Ruth, through the night. Um, two nights on the trot he did through the night. Um, God. Despite their problems, the couple are ready to greet their guests. All members of the Royal Photographic Society. Caroline, I'm, I'm Trevor. Pleased to meet you. Thank this is you. Adrian. Hi, Adrian. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. Right. Thank you. Hello. Lovely to meet you. Oh, what's the story of the dog? <laughs> Everybody loves the dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice icebreaker, though, isn't it? When you come yeah, into it. Yeah. <laughs> Can we have the lounge? Oh, wow. Can you relax in the evenings? Very impressive. Oh, this is, this is beautiful. Absolutely stunning. Thank you very much. It's a bugger to clean. <laughs> Adrian plans to take the photographers out at 4am the next morning to catch the best light. We've got access to over uh, 600 miles of tracks. So we're here. Right so, yeah, yeah, we have a private track that we can get straight down here. If you're into sort of scenery and things like mm. that. Uh, there's some fantastic scenery and the views from there are absolutely stunning. Oh, good. But without Rob to help, Adrian still has farm work to finish. So he heads out on the tractor. And despite offering the guests dinner, Caroline has been too busy to shop. So she suggested they head to the nearest town to find food instead. In terms of uh, eating arrangements tonight, are you eating in? No, we're actually uh, eating out in a um, in the local pub. Is that what you expected to have happen? No, it wasn't really. I had assumed you were going to be fed here. Yeah, so did I. I thought that I thought that was the arrangement. Yes, it's kind of a long way to go and find somewhere to eat. It's vital that this house party succeeds, but they clearly haven't created a good first impression. Frankly, I'm bewildered by Caroline and Adrian's reactions to this photographic party. On the one hand, yes, bedrooms have been painted new linen and there seemed to be a genuine enthusiasm. But where's the preparation? They're meant to be focusing on hospitality, of providing the basic facilities, which they're not doing. This is just not good enough. It's 4 a.m. and despite working at a nearby farm till after midnight, Adrian's ready to take the photographers into the park for their safari, so they can catch the best of the morning light. I've had a good three hours, Kip. Much as that? Yeah. Right. Boots on. Good morning, Adrian. Morning. Morning. You all right? Good you all right? All right. I like the rock to the foreground. Yeah, and, uh, lovely. Beautifully oh. calm. But will this experience be enough to convince Adrian to give up his farming altogether? That's the film. Right. That's the negative, so it's right. a nice... Right, right. It's a nice side, a lot of information. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. The Goodalls don't normally cook for their guests, but after failing to provide last night's dinner, Caroline is keen to impress with a full Scottish breakfast. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Is it? <laughs> Did you have a good time? Uh, I think so, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 lovely. Yeah. And Adrian is already planning for the next safari. We've got 600 and, I think there's 610 miles of track. We've just been down probably 20 miles of it. Mm. You know, I'm going to have to get myself out and get recce in round mm. and really find some spots. Adrian is clearly enthused by the safari experience, but have the Goodalls done enough to impress their guests? I would certainly come back and I would certainly recommend it to other people. If they got a love for this place and a desire to succeed, if they continue in that vein, I can't see how they can fail, really. The guests seem impressed. But Ruth wonders if Adrian and Caroline can really make Black Lochery work long term. Here's my take on it. Personal. You can reject it. 
these people who are here today, the photographers, are being very generous about a lot of things, but they are actually not going to be quite as clinically critical as a paying bunch of people staying here for a week or so. I mean, I, I really don't want to be spiteful about this, but last no. night you both left this building with these four chaps here. Now, you couldn't do that if you had a, a group staying here who you'd agreed to, to host. The problem is that it does require absolutely focused, strategic, structured mm -hmm. work all the time. And I think you've got to really examine very, very closely whether that's something you want to take on. Because if I were in your shoes, and much as I know you love Black Lockery, what I would do is I would do this place up, I'd get it completely fit for market with all the holiday lets and everything else, and I would sell it because I think long term, this is a very difficult project for you two. Because Caroline, you can't manage on your own to do it. And Adrian? Mm -hmm. The sort of bitty piecemeal thing is not going to work. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, it's certainly put a lot of workload onto my shoulders and, uh, you know, it's been quite stressful and quite, uh, well, extremely long hours. And, um, you know, it's a big, big, big place and it's not done overnight. You know, you do one job that should be three days and it turns out to be three weeks because everything behind it's, you know, just a disaster. Mm. At the end of the day, it's about the house and us and, you know, our situation and, and how we deal with it and what we do and, you know. Um... Absolutely. And the last thing that should happen is that Black Lockery becomes a terrible millstone around your necks mm. that yes. causes you to be very unhappy together. I mean, that's not what you bought it for. No. You bought it to have a happy time here. If the Goodalls are going to turn their home into a successful business, Adrian has to give up farming. If he can't commit to that, Staying at Black Lockery is simply not viable. So, I bid you farewell and I wish you yeah. much happiness. Thank you. Right. Either at so Black sure. Lockery or perhaps somewhere else. But, yeah. you know, it's going to be your decision. We have a lot to uh, consider, haven't we? Yes. Just one final thing. Can I remind you that this is an arts and crafts house, not an arts and crafts house. <laughs> so, <laughs> could you please <laughs> take oh. the Westy in the wing collar and put him into long term quarantine? Oh. <laughs> right. Right. Have a safe journey. OK, bye bye. Bye bye, bye Ruth. Bye. Thank you. Black Lockery's future may be uncertain, but when they meet with Ruth one year on, Will the Goodalls have found happiness? We still have our moments where we argue. I just say, oh, Adrian, shut up. Twelve months on, and things couldn't be more different at Black Lochry. Caroline and Adrian have a group of paying guests renting the house, the latest in a stream of bookings over the summer months. Gets to about there at 150 miles an hour and then just flicks round the side of your head between yours, round the side of yours. Today, they are entertaining their guests with a falconry display. He's coming round. He's coming out. That is amazing. Before Ruth came to Black Lockery, there were just five bookings in the calendar. Now, demand is high, with 26 bookings for this year alone. Finances are looking much healthier too, with the house beginning to bring in a profit. <laughs> And it seems the transformation in the business has rubbed off on the couple, who have finally found some happiness in their arts and crafts house. The first thing that strikes me is that you look quite relaxed, quite happy. Are things better? Much better. Yes. yes. We are happy, aren't we? Yeah, we're fine. Yes. Things are going very well. Very well indeed. Yeah. And well, well we, we, still, we still have our moments where we argue, and mm -hmm. people do. And when we have these moments, we just... I just say, oh, Adrian, shut up. We're, we're aiming for the same goal now. Are you busy? Fabulously busy. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful. I'm tired. Yeah. But, but in a good way. Loving it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But the biggest change is in Adrian. Ruth wanted him to give up his farming contracts and spend more time at home. He sold most of his machinery and the long days in the fields are a thing of the past. But to keep a regular wage coming in, he's bought a timber construction company, where stepson Rob works as well. 
Black Clockery still is the love of my life, apart from my wife and my kids. Buying this company has helped me to uh, carry out some initial repairs to Black Clockery. We've had the roof done. Uh, we've had some major problems uh, with uh, damp and things like that. We're on with some en-suites at the moment in the house. I have a regular wage coming in. I'm a lot more relaxed. I've, I'm not stressed out anymore. I feel happy in myself. Uh, my confidence is back. You know, I'm, things, things, things are going great. Things are going absolutely great. Meanwhile, Caroline is running the accommodation business at Black Lockery. With the house now regularly full of people, she's enjoying her work. It's no longer an overwhelming chore. It is a lot more different now. I just We have so much more interaction with the guests that um, you, you know how much it's appreciated now. It's worth it. But the house itself still has a long way to go. On Ruth's advice, the Goodalls have installed two ensuite bathrooms but they are largely unfinished. She also suggested the outbuildings become holiday lets, but these remain dilapidated and unrenovated. The Goodalls say that there's been very little time to develop Black Lochery beyond making the basic changes. But that's not enough for Ruth. What's happened about embracing the idea that this is a very fine arts and crafts house? Because you don't seem to have kind of run with that particularly. Well. It's all still there, Ruth, and it's not forgotten about. Um, to me, if a shower room is more important for a guest than a nice bit of furniture, mm -hmm. and it's still there, but it's a case of prioritising. Mm -hmm. and, and the other side is we have been so, so busy mm. that we can't actually get into the house at the moment. But can I just tell you, Caroline, that is something I absolutely know about. Yes. I really know about this as a hotelier. And the biggest mistake you ever, ever can make is to think that because you're really busy now, that you haven't got time or access to make things better. Right. And it's such a false move. Yeah. I've seen it happen too often where hotels get tarder and tarder and tarder because they've been so busy and nobody's found the time or the money and they don't want to put customers off coming. But you just sometimes have to. Did I tell you that they sent a load of photographs? Yes. Caroline has grown into her role as host. Before Ruth came to Black Lockery, food arrangements for guests were ad hoc and unplanned. But now Caroline has help in the kitchen and feels much more efficient than she did a year ago. Ruth did teach me organisation and it just takes all the panic out of it. You have everything measured and weighed and yeah, it just makes, makes the job a lot easier. She's, she's, uh, she offered invaluable advice, did Ruth. I'm a new woman. It's, uh, it's marvellous. I'm just really, really enjoying it. But the good all still haven't done much to exploit what lies right on their doorstep. There's been no mention about safaris, so should I extrapolate from that that they're not happening? Um, we tried it, Ruth. We've tried marketing it, and the top and bottom is that people just don't want to share a bathroom. Right. Um, I completely understand yes. that, but I still think that added value is a very, very good idea, um, especially for longer stays when people really do like that kind of thing. And I think if you were able to add back in the notion of Adrian taking people up into the National Park and, and you know, exploring it, I still think that's something, given that you have that very special access to those trails, mm -hmm. that would be foolish to not pursue. The business at Black Lochery is thriving. And Adrian and Caroline can now live the dream they'd always hoped for. So there's no more talk of going separate ways? Oh, no. I couldn't get rid of Caroline. I've got rid of my contracting business. I think that's as much as I could get rid of. <laughs> Can't get rid of Caroline. She's my backbone, really. I'm really delighted, most of all, to see that you're so demonstrably happy together. Mm. I mean, that's great. No house, well, perhaps one or two houses are worth a divorce, but certainly not Black Lockery. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fantastic what you've done and how you've changed, if you like, your behaviour, which has made life so much easier for you. And in the end, Black Lockery will benefit. It is already, yes. and it will continue to do so. So I would say, teacher says full marks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Ruth. Thank you.
This is Chester's in the Scottish borders. Owners John and Ellie Henderson desperately want to live here, but are trapped in London jobs to pay for its upkeep, while the house crumbles. Last year, they asked Ruth Watson to help rescue this national treasure from ruin. They don't seem to be able to embrace the idea of reality. It's a non-starter. Really? Absolute non-starter. It's all starting, ask about face. I don't give a about your spiritual quest. Don't be too concerned about that. Oh, my God. One year on, has Ruth's advice secured a future for Chester's? John, very good to see you. Can't help but notice Ellie's not with you. There's, there's no problems, I hope. Chester's is a Grade A listed Georgian country house near Ancrum in the Scottish borders. John Henderson inherited his ancestral home from his grandfather six years ago. Shortly afterwards, he married Ellie, but they've never found a way to move here. To pay the £20,000 a year bills at Chester's, the Hendersons are stuck in London jobs. John works in advertising, and Ellie runs an actor's training company. It's my job. I understand that's your job. We'd love to live here full time. We just adore the place. It's a question of money at the end of the day, and you know, how do we make enough to live here and to enjoy living here? Each weekend, they leave their small flat on a busy city road to make the 350-mile journey to Scotland and the country house they can't afford to live in. This feels like home. Um, London is, is an amazing place, but it it's, doesn't feel like home. Their dream is to leave London and live at Chester's full time. But this historic house is in peril. The whole of the East Wing is derelict and in dire need of at least a £100,000 overhaul. It's something that I can remember since my earliest childhood. I remember my grandfather and sort of playing with him as, you know, his sort of five, six-year-old grandson. Yeah, it's a gift to us. The whole place is absolutely something I'd like to hand on to our children, and it's something that hopefully we can hand on in a better state than we found it. If Chester's is to survive for the generations to come, it must start paying for itself now. The idea of failing is almost beyond comprehension. It just has to happen. Ruth is on her way to the Scottish borders, where she will formulate a plan to save Chester's. First, she needs to learn more about the house and its owners. Hello. Hi, Ruth. Hi. So well, you're John? John. Yes, and Ellie. Hi, how do you do? Welcome to Chester's. Thank you very much. So this is the dining room, where you can really start to sort of see the history of the house in the portraits. And you know what? You never painted dining room green, so I'm very intrigued. Is, did, did you paint it green or was yes, it? Yes, it was actually me. Ah, um, right. It it's was... a very in, unauthentic colour for um, dining rooms. It was so dark in here that I actually you thought, thought you make it more dark. Make it more dark. You would never have a green dining room because it actually makes the food look awful. This uh, portrait here is uh, of Thomas Ogilvy, who was my great, 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 great grandfather. And he was actually the man who originally built the house. His son wasn't quite cut of the same cloth and was, I think, a bit of a spendthrift and uh, enjoyed life uh, to the extent that the uh, house was uh, completely mortgaged up to the hilt. He went off to Edinburgh gambling or something. Yes, I think something like that. Eventually, the troubled house passed to John's grandfather. But when he died, he didn't leave it to his daughter. It was actually jumped straight to me by my excuse grandfather. Me, so. Excuse me, <laughs> As a woman, yeah, um, incredibly uh, uh, correct. Can I, I mean, it's not the royal family here. I mean, what, what, what's the problem with... Um... I think it was just a family where primogeniture ruled, really. And in some ways, it makes a lot of sort of sense that... Yeah, go on, explain to, that. <laughs> to pass it, though, I mean, if you look at sort of what happens in France, where you divide estates between all the children sure. equally, yeah, you that's actually not end up with the estates breaking apart. And so at least sticking to one person means it survives intact. And would we allow a girl to inherit if Absolutely. she happened to be firstborn? Could we break Absolutely. the Absolutely. We can break the tradition, <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
John and Ellie are striving to safeguard their house for future generations and pass it on free of debt and decay. Ruth knows an obvious way to kickstart the cash flow they need to begin this process, but will it fit with the Henderson sense of family heritage? How prepared would you be to say, OK, key weeks, maybe Christmas, maybe month or two in the summer, half-term holidays, we would let this house out to people who would love to come here and enjoy this beautiful place? To me, it's a non-starter. Really? Absolute non-starter. Um, I would rather, you know, go down with the ship than, you know, have to rent it out on a permanent basis or something like that. However, John and Ellie are willing to share the house with people they know. I run a company, it's yeah. called The Actors Temple, in London's West End. And uh, there's, a, there's a possibility of, I thought, running courses from here and uh, housing them up in the attic right. in a kind of dormitory style. We could probably right. keep about uh, 12 actors here. For, <laughs> keep them here. Like dogs. <laughs> for, a week, <laughs> for a week course. And it would be a, a retreat for actors, but with That's a very... Like a kennels um, for actors. <laughs> no. Well, a very, very nice kennel if it's going to be a kennel, so... OK. Um, if you're going to have actors in the attics, yes. how does that square with the fact that you wouldn't want a family or some party of eight people coming and using the house for two weeks in August? I think Do they have to just be actors? No, they don't have to no. just be actors, but I think they need to be sort of people that we understand, appreciate and, and sort of can relate to. But could the Hendersons tempt London's arty set to the borders of Scotland? The success of Ellie's company testifies to the fact that they do want and appreciate this training. In London. Mm -hmm. And secondly... In London. In London. But secondly, the quality of the tutors that they have means that they travel anywhere. I mean, some of your actors are going off uh, to the Caribbean. I think mm. dragging people to the borders as opposed to sending them to the mm. Caribbean is possibly seen in different light. As Ruth takes her leave, John and Ellie reveal their dread of rowdy overnight guests. Obviously, yes, it does have to make money and it does have to pay it its own way, but first and foremost, it's absolutely our home. As much as they pay us, it's not worth the fear of this place being wrecked. The Hendersons have strong principles. Can Ruth satisfy their sense of duty and make the cash they need to stop Chester's from crumbling away? I think they have a responsibility to do this up, frankly. I think that you could end up blowing every penny you have. John and Ellie Henderson own Chester's in the Scottish borders. John's ancestral home and the centrepiece of a thousand acre estate, which includes 14 cottages, a huge stable block, and a mile long stretch of the River Teviot. The Palladian style house was built in 1790 by local architect William Elliot. With its classic symmetrical frontage and perfectly proportioned rooms, it's a superb example of Georgian architecture at its finest. The house has never been altered or added to, and as such, commands a grade A listing. This morning, Businesswoman Ruth Watson is investigating Ellie's idea to host acting courses. Part of Ellie's proposal is to convert the derelict stable block into workshops for her thespians. It's a nice rushing staircase to the hayloft. <laughs> Very fine and very derelict. <laughs> it is. I, I always, um, the first time I, I saw this, I thought, what an amazing natural stage area, though. Yes, it is. That's something that occurred to me. But as you can see, it's um, extremely unstable, <laughs> to say the least, really. Unstable. Mm. Very good. I mean, the problem with all of this is that this must be grade one listed, is it? Yes, yeah, yeah absolutely. I and mean, you're going to get every organisation, all the heritage people, the building regs. I mean, you're not going to be able to put a slate in place unless somebody says it's the right material. Costly. But really this is a long-term dream, mm. I think. It's something that... I like the words long-term and dream. <laughs> Do the keep, two go together? Keep, Does that... <laughs> keep thinking that way. Yeah. So Ellie has romantic and expensive dreams for one crumbling edifice, while John has plans for another. He wants to turn the estate's old dairy into a brewery. Here 
think we are. So, this is the site of a potential brewery. Water access to? Water, there's mains water supply. The actual heating and boiling elements would all be run on LPG gas, so right. that's portable. Sounds expensive, though. Uh, all of it's quite expensive. And what about access to and from the site? Because we came down a little muddy track. I mean, how would that work? There would have to be a whole new road. That's expensive. Um, no, I mean, it, this is not a small project. John plans to spend all his savings and get a grant to restore the derelict proposed brew house. It seems both his and Ellie's business sense is clouded by romantic long-term plans. There is no point ever in making a huge capital investment unless you know you're going to get a guaranteed return. It's all starting us about face. But John has a particularly personal reason for his long-term dream for Chester's. Behind a locked door, Ruth discovers why the house holds such a special place in his heart. Oh. Wow. This is the first time that his grandfather's tack room has been opened in over 25 years. It would literally have been like this since my grandfather had his accident. He uh, paralysed himself riding really? from his neck downwards. So he actually left this room, went, got on his horse and yes, didn't I come back to so. it? Yes. Because there's um, a calendar there from 1981. That was the, the year he had his accident. No, and I was actually um, riding with him. I was on a leading rein, and uh, uh. my pony pulled him off. So it was a oh, sort of. Oh, John! I know, it's all. It was quite a moment, and I was only eight years old. Yeah, well, you're not, you don't have to be no. responsible as an eight year old for that. But I mean, that but presumably brings it all yeah. back, that whole sense of. No, it certainly does. John is sincere about doing the right thing at Chester's. But he and Ellie need to look closer to home before they embark on their grand plans. Parts of the house itself are in urgent need of restoration. Oh, my God. This is absolutely derelict. The abandoned East Wing was once the bustling living quarters for the staff at Chester's in years gone by. But this wing has been left to disintegrate and could cost thousands to renovate. You can shut the door on things for so long, but after a bit, it's... Um, I think they have a responsibility to do this up, frankly, and uh, it's going to take a lot of money. And as well as these rooms, four of the estate's 14 cottages need complete renovation. Ruth's also concerned that the accommodation in the main house might not be good enough for paying guests. Ellie is expecting people to come up here, actors who are going to pay money, they're going to have to live together, and the bathroom facilities are extremely limited, and I believe she wants to charge money for it. Now, personally, I wouldn't pay. The next morning, Ruth's off on her travels, looking for ways to accommodate John's wildly expensive plans. Catherine Stewart, the owner of Traquair, also inherited her house, along with an established and successful on-site brewery. This is the brew house. Right. The real essence of the problem for John is that, you know, a, we've got to establish a cash flow as quickly as possible just to pay for the upkeep of the house. But I don't want him to go investing literally 200, 250,000 pounds in, in a venture that may actually prove to be more of a gamble than a calculated gamble. I can't remember offhand how many microbreweries there are in, in, in Scotland, but um, there's, there's a large number. Do you think that with all the microbreweries you've mentioned, that any of them would have spare capacity so that instead of him spending money on setup costs, he could actually take his barley and hops and things and they would make it for him? Yeah, no, I mean, that's certainly, a, I mean, a really good option. I mean, happy to do it here. <laughs> we'd always, we'd always do it. We should... <laughs> Ruth's found a way to get John's beer into the bottle without him having to build a brewery. 
Now all she has to do is persuade him it's a good idea. After three days in the borders, it's time for Ruth to deliver her plan on how to make Chester's profitable. She wants to generate £20,000 a year to pay the bills and find a substantial part of the 100000 needed for the renovation of the East Wing. Hello. Only with a viable income can John and Ellie finally leave London to fulfil their responsibilities at Chester's. At the end of the day, you have a duty to this house. Mm -hmm. It is crumbling. There are parts which are actually falling down. Yes. And I think if you want to have the joy of living here, I'm afraid you've got to have some of the pain of it. And you really do have to spend money on those areas that are falling down. As well as the derelict wing, John has those four vacant cottages also in need of modernisation. Ruth thinks the empty cottages could be restored and let out for income. And she's got an idea how both the wing and the cottages could be renovated more economically. What I also would like to commend to you, the thought of, is actually employing a full-time maintenance person mm. who's got good building skills. It saves a fortune. Mm. And it also means that they're on your payroll, you can deploy them where you want. Despite her reservations, Ruth wants to allow the Hendersons to pursue their favourite ideas. Now, acting. Yes. What I would like to charge you with, Ellie, yes. is actually doing a trial, a genuine call to action for a group of people who you mm. don't know yes. to come and trial it so that you can see whether it's actually going to work and find out all the hiccups before you put all your eggs in that basket. Now, John, your brewery. Do not invest this amount of money in it. You don't need to do it. You can still have your own beer, you can still use your own barley, but what you can do is you can actually go and use the free capacity that a lot of the microbreweries that are around, and there are a lot of them, mm -hmm. competition, have to offer. It means you don't have to dive in at the deep end. You can go in the shallow end and just see how it all pans out. I think that you could end up blowing every penny you have for absolutely nothing and actually being in just as pile of state mm. and just as much as a wastrel as the ancestor. Mm. It's April in London. Desperate to prove that their romantic ideas can become financial successes, the Hendersons have sprung into action. With a month to go until the acting course trial at Chester's, Ellie and her colleagues have been busy recruiting willing participants. We didn't have to wait very long for the responses to come in, but, um, but it's sold. It's great. You've got actors that are getting this amazing experience. Yeah. Um, by the, the actors will be paying to join a five-day Shakespeare workshop. And it's like, that is a hell of an experience. And the Hendersons have been at Chester's every weekend to bring the attic accommodation up to scratch before the actors arrive. We are decorating and carpeting and plastering and doing it all ourselves. It's just the two of us. We are quite exhausted, actually. But it's, it's a great thing to be able to kind of see that you've achieved that, so we're pleased we've done it. Across town at the Hendersons' flat, John's also working hard marketing his beer with the help of Nigel, an old friend from advertising. The way this is sort of developed is into, into something like this. That gets the journey from the field to the pint across much more clearly. Everything about it has come from, you know, Chester's and, and the Scottish Borders Brewery. Yeah. So wherever you are in the country, whether it be just up the road or in London, this has actually been brought to, to you. you from the Scottish Borders. Great stuff. I love it. But John is now so taken with his plough to pint ethos that he passionately believes his beer must be produced entirely at Chester's. Hello. Hi, Hi John. Hi. How are you? Nice to see you. In he meets Ruth at his local pub in London to tell her he doesn't want to trial his beer at another brewery. I very much want this to be tied in to the estate. I want it to be a part of the estate. I want you know, people to be able to walk around the brewery and go, look, there's the barley growing in the fields. There are the cows that are going to eat the spent grains. Yeah, there's the wastewater that's going on in the fields as fertiliser now, that it's a very much a holistic project. Right. And it's all about provenance. Do you think you've worked too long in advertising? I don't know about that. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> 
all but very, very think... green and cute. But you want to do something there with integrity yeah. and which you can make a product from yeah. and which is going to, if you like, fill your soul with sunshine. Yes, that's exactly what it's about. It's obvious that John is not going to go ahead with the trial because he's so hung up about the provenance of the barley. But the fact is that any brewery will take two or three years, maybe even four from start-up to possible profit. So what they're left with is revenue from the acting courses. And I really don't see that this is ever going to be enough to support both them and the house and its major repairs. One month later, it's time for John and Ellie to trial the actors' residential school at Chester's. They're busy preparing food for the ten actors who will share their house for five days. I want you to come into my lair. I want you to come into your lair. I want you to come into my lair. They're determined to impress their guests, so the actors' grapevine will be buzzing with news of their experiences at Chester's. They also need to convince Ruth this is going to be a money spinner. Oh, I see. Hello? 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 The actors arrived last night, and while they enjoy lunch, Ruth wants to see what the Hendersons have done to turn the empty attic into cosy digs worthy of the course fees. How long has this all been taking? Have you been up a How lot? How long has it been taking? We've been up most weekends. Yeah. In fact, well, every weekend, yeah, yeah to be honest. So um, it's, it's taken a lot of work, and it's been John and I, apart from the plumber yeah. who put in the new bathroom, yeah. it's been just constantly he and I up yeah. here doing yeah. all Hand the work. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's actually been really quite an accomplishment, I think. Um, so this is... Oh, new bathroom. The new bathroom. Oh. Very sensible, keep it very, you know, low cost and uncomplicated, I think, is the way to go. So this is the other couple of areas. Oh, I know, I remember this. Yeah. This is where we stood and looked about how many people you were going to stack up and whether they were going to mind sharing accommodation. That's right, yeah. And they're fine about it. Absolutely fine. It seems to be going yeah. very well. So I mean... what did you do about beds? Oh, very. So they're sort of futon-y beds. Yes. Apparently very comfortable. <laughs> I've um, laid down a... in one briefly, but... Uh... Well, I think, you know, what I think you've done that's very clever is that they're big single beds, aren't they? So mm -hmm. they don't, they, it's not like being in a hospital, which is really good. Ruth approves of the accommodation, but is still concerned that the acting school is based on an unrealistic romantic vision and not on sound business sense. But I think it's also part of, of, of yours and John's kind of, if you like, spiritual quest I mean um, you know which I have some reservations about because I do think it's a degree of idealism which mm. may not provide enough sheer moolah I don't give a about your spiritual quest I mean I've got to be you know, I don't think it's a spiritual you know. quest to be <laughs> honest no I don't I mean I'm I'm on in no under no kind of uh, illusion. illusion about about what it is that we're doing here. And it's vitally important to us both to keep this going. So it's not some little thing that, that we're playing about with. Mm. So don't be too concerned about that. The Hendersons may not be under any illusion, but will they ever make Chester's pay for itself? You have a dream, I have a problem. These people are on a course of optimistic idealism, and I don't agree with it. John and Ellie Henderson are trying to generate an income at Chester's. Ruth Watson has given them some ideas, but she's not convinced they're being realistic. However, John has taken some of Ruth's advice and employed a handyman to renovate his vacant cottages, and eventually that derelict wing. Hi. Hello, Craig. Yes. Yes. I'm Ruth. How'd you do? How'd you do? I think you know. We know each other. Yeah. 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 So, John, I mean, we talked, didn't we, about um, doing up some of the houses and, most importantly, getting a maintenance chap who could do it for you. This is he. Yeah. This is no, he. which is fantastic, actually. How long do you think before it's ready for rental? Ask the man. I would say this one would be a couple of months, um, two to three months. Yeah. And are you looking at this at cottage Holiday rentals, are you looking no, at it as long-term rental? I think this would be long-term rental, yep. um, just because I think it's not the perfect holiday cottage, but I think as a long-term rental cottage, it would be great. When the cottages are renovated, they should generate a few thousand pounds a year. But that's not enough for John and Ellie to move to Chester's. 
They're hoping the bulk of the income will come from the actors' courses. Her name is Portia. <laughs> so has the trial been a financial success? Where money is, and I don't question me, I'll have it on my trust or for my sake. Come on! <laughs> <laughs> Now, how, how much are you charging per student? Well, we know you suggested 600. Yeah. And uh, considering this is a trial course and we want to see and kind of learn mm -hmm. from it, yeah. and uh, we decided to charge 450. No, no, I think that's fine to do a discounted mm. rate if it's, you know, you're uh, right, it's it a is. trial. So what are the costs so far? Well, food. Yeah. We're doing the catering this time, yeah. which is which is going well. Yeah. It's tiring. Do you know how many hundreds well. of... Um, budgeted for sort of 750, and I think that's pretty much About where right. we're going to be. We might be just But under, it's your actually. labour costs at the moment. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah rather yeah. than somebody else's, yeah. yeah. What about other expenses? Um, well, there's the sort of tutor's costs as well. How much? Do uh, another sort of 500, 600 on top of that. Right. And then you've got um, the fact that we're splitting the proceeds 50-50 between the house and Evans company, the actors' company, yeah. okay. as they're providing tutors and the people and that sort of thing. So, so you might end up with about twelve hundred pounds 12 for yourself. Twelve to fifteen hundred for the week, right? Yeah. Or okay. five nights, as it is. Well, that's better so. than a kick in the head, isn't it? Isn't it? Is. How many of these courses per year would you see yourself doing? Because I don't think you'd be able to get 42 or whatever, do you, on a weekly basis? I don't think we'd want to, either. Yeah. I think, you know, we'd be looking at maybe doing one a month, say. Right, so 12. Um, so it's not, you know, we're not yeah. going to turn ourselves okay. over completely. I'm just turning that back to income, mm -hmm. you know, 12,000, yeah. 14,000 pounds a year, nothing like what you're earning at the moment. No. Well, it's so, a little, it will be a little bit more than that. It will be more like sort of 20,000 a year. Might be slightly on the rich side on there, no, but anyway. It wouldn't be you if okay. you were being a little bit <laughs> suspicious. <laughs> sort of. No, this is true. <laughs> I'm very cynical about your costings. You should yeah. know that. Or to find both, or bring your latter hazard back again and thankfully rest better of the first. I'm very concerned that John and Ellie will not be diverted from their original thoughts and plans. They don't seem to be able to embrace the idea of reality. It's all idealistic. It's all sort of a way with the fairies, really. They come from London. They think they're going to replace that income here, living in this house, which demands so much money spent on it. I don't think this is going to work. I don't think they're going to realise £20,000 from the actor's studio over the course of a year. I think it's going to be more like fourteen, sixteen thousand. 16000 Is BAT involved in it? I don't know. I just know that these people are on a course of optimistic idealism and I don't agree with it. The actor's courses might pay the household bills, but they won't provide all the income the Hendersons need. Ruth has to come up with a new plan for Chester's, and quickly. The next morning, Ruth is back with a fresh idea. Although the Hendersons don't want overnight guests trashing Chester's, Ruth still believes the only way to secure their future and save their crumbling house is by letting it out. She thinks day hire rather than long lets could be the way forward. The country house day hire business is worth 20 million pounds a year in Scotland alone and Chester's and its grounds would lend itself perfectly to private meetings and team-building events. Joanna Goddard is a specialist in corporate hire of historic properties. So what sort of price are we looking at then for a day hire? For a day hire, you can get between 800 and 1,000 pounds, depending on well, it's not the requirement. Sneeze, that, is it? Well, exactly, and um, a lot of that would be probably outside activity for team building, yeah. and you need to factor in providing lunch or dinner. Yes. Um, and if that's a small group of six or eight, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Mm. If it's a larger group, there'd be an additional charge per head to cover the, the greater catering costs oh. of that. Oh. But it allows John and Ellie to really explore what they can achieve here. And you could genuinely recommend Chester's to them? Absolutely, yes. I think it's a, the stunning sense of arrival, which is always one of the key things mm. we look for. It feels remote, but actually it's pretty accessible. Joanna is confident Chester's would make money as a day hire venue. Now all Ruth has to do is persuade John and Ellie to ease their restrictions on who they allow into their home. John and Ellie, you have a dream, I have a problem. And the problem is this. Let's say we've got um, this year, 
for the next from now on from 12 mm -hmm. months from now we've got 20 grand let's be generous about the active studio and assuming it's filled up every single mm -hmm. moment of the time yeah. your heating lighting costs my understanding are about 20 grand yeah. so that gets rid of that one mm -hmm. yeah okay where else is the money going to come from decorous people from yes. the corporate world will come and spend a day here without accommodation, mm -hmm. without you requiring to do anything to the building. All this gentle shabbiness would absolutely appeal to mm -hmm. the kind of market. And for that, you can get 800 to 1,000 pounds a day. Mm. Well, that would be great. Yeah, completely up for that. Yeah. So well, we've always, the that. problem we've always had about that is, is the drunken people sort of flailing yeah. around and staying overnight. Don't need to. Um, now, so you're saying to me, mm -hmm. I'm noting this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're saying to me that you're quite happy to... Can we do another trial? Because that's what I'd like to do. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Let's do a corporate day, see that people behave nicely, that they don't cause you any problems. I know that you can get at least 40 and up to 100 days a year right. in this locality right, for this kind of house. Be absolutely staggering. I mean, that I mean, just changes the whole picture, yes. doesn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I just didn't know that sort of thing existed. So right. if it does, then that would be... Fantastic, really. Yeah. Although the Hendersons are very happy to give day hire a try, they're still equally cautious about protecting their heritage. I don't want to sort of either rush into something just for the sake of it. I would like to sort of really see that it fits with what we believe this place is about. It's July. The first day hire trial is taking place at Chester's tomorrow morning. Shall we do it? Yeah. Go on. <laughs> Tomorrow's event is corporate team building, based on role-playing as secret agents. Unlike for the actors' course, there's very little preparation needed from the hosts. Hi, Eddie. It's uh, John Henderson. How are you doing? But the Hendersons are desperate for the day to be a success and want to check that everything's in place. Hey, how are you doing? Good. Have you spoken to Eddie? Oh, I just spoke to Eddie, yes. yes. Um, uh, and it all sounds very easy, actually. They're just bringing everything that they need. Uh, okay. So it's all quite straightforward. We've just got to provide the sort of cutlery uh, for two courses for the lunch, uh, and that's it. But John remains unconvinced that the event is going to work out. This is something that Ruth suggested, and it's sort of, you know, her and Joanna are very much sort of coordinating the whole thing, and so hopefully it won't be too stressful, as it were, and, you know, we can just sort of sit back and see how it all pans out. We have ordered kind of a few things just in case, like tea and coffee flasks and things like that, but, you know, if they're used to doing these kind of events, then they should have everything covered. But um, we're pretty good, in, pretty good in crises as well, so if we need to do anything, then we can. John and Ellie are hoping day hire could be the key to solving their financial problems without upsetting their sense of loyalty to John's ancestral home. Done. It's the first corporate hire day at Chester's and John and Ellie are making the final preparations for what they hope will provide them with the regular income they need to leave their London lives behind. Uh, I've done it too. Five months after her first visit, Ruth is back in Scotland to see if her rescue plan for Chester's has worked. John and Ellie are hosting a corporate team building day and uh, given that they don't want anyone in the house apart from actors, they might find it very painful. I really hope they don't because it could be such a good source of income for them. So today's spy hunt game is a crucial test to see if John and Ellie are happy sharing their house with strangers. Despite their concerns, the Hendersons are making an effort to welcome their 20 corporate guests, making tea, mingling, and dressing up for the occasion. Hello. Hi, Ellie. How, How are you? you? I'm very Hi. well, thank you. Very good. <laughs> good. So how are things generally going? Uh, good. Yes. Uh, it's sort of quite nice not to have to organise this one ourselves yeah. for a change. Yeah. Uh, That's a good point, actually, yeah. isn't it? They Absolutely. just descend on you and a you don't A little less hectic than usual. Yeah. Yeah. mission has begun. I am Agent 75. I am the head of intelligence for the spy hunt organization. And from not wanting any strangers in their house, the Hendersons now have 20 of them 
licensed to roam all over Chester's. Hi, what's your name? Ben. Oh, mademoiselle. In return for opening their house, the Hendersons are receiving £600 for this half-day hire and could expect to earn up to £1,000 for each full day. For the next part of your mission. Okay. Corporate hire agent Joanna has been called in to reassure them it's a good idea. Your best house, how much income does it generate a year for its owners? Um, they can turn, I think, probably around 300,000 a year is one of the most successful I've worked with. That's quite a nice figure. 300,000 is a lot of money, but that mm. is a very established venue that has grown over the years and yeah. now has a dedicated But market. even if it's 100,000, it's still yeah. not bad, is it? Yeah. 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 No. How much for the, the, the derelict wing, do you think? I think we need to do about 100 of these, probably, yeah? somewhere in that oh, region. That's not impossible, um, which wouldn't be impossible. And Joanna points out that John and Ellie could actually turn their derelict wing into a selling point while earning money for the restoration. A lot of corporates these days are very much focused on corporate social responsibility mm. and ethical purchasing. So if mm. they're going to spend a lot on regular events or regular meeting room hire, yeah. then if they choose Chester's, mm. a, a good way of keeping in touch with clients as well is just to let them know that, you know, once they've visited that, the wing has started, the mm. works yeah. on the wings have started, yeah. or, yeah. you know, such yeah. and such has been purchased. And if you discuss that when they were there, keeping in touch with them, they feel they are contributing mm. to mm. restoring, mm. you know, part of our heritage. Could be that. Important. That could be your yeah. whole thing. It's yeah. the, the yeah. wing fund. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and actually have the red thermometer somewhere and yeah. just they can yeah. see that they're yeah. helping with yeah. yeah. <laughs> Day hire could reap the Hendersons rich rewards. Did you enjoy that? If they're happy to continue with it. Okay. Good. In first place, odd jobs. Yeah. Is it right that it's all over? Yes. Apparently it is. so. It's done. What, two hours in? Yeah. I know. Well, I think, I think one team were doing particularly well, and, and I don't know. And the, yeah. uh, this is money fold rope. We booked them immediately. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> we're loving it. So. <laughs> I know, done by lunchtime. It's fantastic. So this could be the way to go. It could be a it winner. Could well be. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well done. Well worth the effort, I hope. Thank you. At last, Ruth has found a rich source of easy revenue that meets with John and Ellie's approval. Building up the day hire events could help the Hendersons finally fulfill their dream of living at Chester's. For me, the big thing is this house, and I think we actually have come some way from John and yours original comment, which was you couldn't bear to share it with anybody other than actors, because today has been a demonstration that actually it wasn't such a horrible experience. Having no, other... it was great. But before she leaves, Ruth wants to make an observation. You were quite precious at the beginning, I have to say this. <laughs> you know? And, okay. and part of me understood okay. it, but part of me also said, you know, you have actually got to open up a little bit about this. I think you have both been very guarded for possibly different reasons. Well, I think, and... I mean, a lot of that's because it's, it's felt very much like a trial and yeah. that we as people have been on trial. Yeah. Do we deserve it? Are we selfish? Yeah. All this sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's very much to us felt like that. I'm really heartened to hear your response and your vig vigorous response as well, because actually I think by, by opening up yourselves to the things that have been thrown at you, you know, actually it is going to make you stronger. And I think you, you have taken on board what it really means to live here and what you might have to sacrifice to live here. Well, I think this, this whole thing has been about turning talk into commitment. Mm -hmm. And once, you know, I think we've made that transition mm -hmm. from just, you know, dreaming, talking, saying we will do this to actually doing it and committing to do it. And I think that's going to make a huge, hopefully, difference to everything. Yeah. So. And so how long before you're living here? I think within the year. Within the year, certainly, and hopefully possibly by Christmas. So the air of Chester's and his wife will be moving in very shortly. Well, yes. 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 You could say that? Yes, absolutely. The Hendersons seem confident that they have the skills to save Chester's. But one year on, will they have done enough to satisfy Ruth? I had felt that your need for money was kind of fairly immediate. Yeah, as long as we keep it wind and water tight, it can sit there. One year on, and new life has been breathed into Chester's. John and Ellie are expecting their first baby. 
Now there'll be an heir for the Henderson family. John, very good to see you. Can't help but notice Ellie's not with you. There's, there's no problems, I hope. Uh, no, no problems at all, but she is about two weeks away or so from having a baby. Wonderful. Yes. Oh, that's what, many congratulations. Well, thank you. And how has that affected things? I mean, I, you were moving, hopefully, from London to Scotland. Has, has that been achieved? Well, we're actually going to have the baby in London right at this moment. We're sort of down there, but predominantly we're sort of spending our time at Chester's. So, so, so how's it worked? I mean, your, your job in advertising was very much London-based. We talked about yeah. you, you know, perhaps being freelance. Did anything change on that front? Uh, yes, it did. I actually resigned from the job in London. Um, and I still occasionally do do some freelance, and so the sort of base has definitely moved from London. So you're much to more of Scotland. a free agent in terms yes, of location. Yes, in that respect. Yeah. By going freelance, John is able to keep earning money, and has found work in London and Scotland. They're thinking about bringing the baby up at Chester's, but Ellie is keen to find a balance between motherhood and her career. As far as um, baby being on the way. Um, you know, obviously, I don't know what to. We don't know what to expect. It's our first. Uh, it's our first child. But um, but I'm very. I am very passionate about um, my line of work. I don't consider that that will suddenly end. But certainly, if I think a child is given a choice between growing up here or in London, I think as a child I would choose. <laughs> I would choose here. With the next generation on the way, it's more important than ever that Chester's pays for itself. They're following Ruth's advice to market the house as a multi-purpose venue. John's maintenance man has completed work on one of the four derelict cottages, which is now let out. Work's begun on restoring the second, and along with bookings for fishing stays, the Hendersons are looking at revenue of £1,000 a month. But the current economic climate has meant the corporate event market is slow. They haven't had any bookings since Ruth left, so they've employed Joe Heaney as part-time marketing manager to drum up business. The responses are sort of coming back, but it's not exactly a landslide, is it? I mean, with the corporates, what you find is that people have been making people redundant. So then then, having a big party, to then have a big party yeah. or put on any form of corporate entertainment or even sort of team building or anything is just not seen to be the done thing at the moment. I think we were very excited at the prospect of 100 events. I mean, who wouldn't be? But looking at it realistically, it was something that, until we got Joe on board, um, it was never going to be realistic. You know, people don't just discover Chester's. You need to do a lot of marketing and a lot of publicity on that, which is what the brochures have been so good at doing. But John's heart still lies in one idea that Ruth was very sceptical about. His plans for a microbrewery are forging ahead and the annual crop of barley is ready for harvesting. I think Ruth was um, very worried about this whole project um, because it involved a big capital expenditure, a big investment, and there was no sort of immediate return, no sort of, as she would put it, you know, where's the cash? Uh, and she's right in that respect, there isn't. But I think when you're sort of dealing with an estate as a whole, you've actually got to look for sort of much longer term solutions. And I think the way that the brewery fits in to the estate, the fact that we do grow the barley, it's all here on our doorstep and we will be taking that and adding value to it and turning it into a product product in the long term is actually going to be a very sensible option. So it's actually very exciting that, you know, I'm standing here now in the middle of some barley um, that we have grown that will actually then become our first beer. The brewery? Yes. Now, what's, what are the plans there or, or not? Um, well, since we last spoke, I have been on a course and learnt how yeah. to brew. Right. Um, which, was, uh, which was great, actually, because I, you know, there was a slight sort of side of me that was, OK, I've got this idea, but mm. am I actually going to enjoy it? Mm. And in actual fact, sort of from the moment of, you know, walking into real live breweries where we did the placements and that sort of thing, you know, the smell and the sort mm. of the heat and the steam and the feeling of it, I, it just sort of something instantly clicked with me. And, yeah, it kind of took me back to being on farms in my childhood and that sort of thing. And I sort of, you yeah, know, there was a little bit of relief that, yes, I think I do like this. Yes. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's handy, isn't that it? That was good. So this is what will be... John's invited his brew course lecturer, Dr. Sinjan Usher, to Chester's to see if the old dairy site is suitable for his brewery. And in terms of the whole project, do you think it's mad? Or what, putting a brewery on a farm? Yeah, exactly. No, there's, uh, there's evidence, certainly uh, in Northumberland way, that, uh, that you know, farm breweries are working. Right. Uh, then they can recycle the water, the yeast, back into the land. So it does work on that level as well. Yeah. Just need some good weather, you can grow some hops. We do, yeah. <laughs> 
John is waiting on the approval of a government grant to provide the capital for his brewery. Then, renovation of the dairy buildings will get underway. But for John and Ellie, right now, there are more pressing issues. So, yes, it goes down to uh, weekly appointments now. All right, getting close. Yeah, yeah. so it can happen any day. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Prepare yourself. I will do. <laughs> Better get building that cot. Yes, yeah. yeah. But despite the positive changes, the Hendersons still don't have the £100,000 it will take to restore their derelict wing. I had felt that your need for money was kind of fairly immediate. I have a slightly different view to you in, in terms of things. You know, as long as we keep it wind and water tight, it can sit there. It is all taking a very long time, but then they are all very big projects. But you're certainly not going to be emulating the naughty relative who squandered everything and put Chester's into um, jeopardy, are you? No, I don't think I've had time to do any of that squandering. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been far too busy just... <laughs> Keeping things going. Talking of DNA, should it be a girl, do you have any problem with the notion of primogeniture? We, we did... A, a, no, I know, we, we touched <laughs> on it before. This. No, no problem at all. I so, mean, a I'm... girl can inherit Chester's? Absolutely. Good. Music to my ears. <laughs>